And so it once again falls to me to nominate the games that were best, the games that were worst, and the games that fell asleep after one thrust and left me to wander an unfamiliar neighbourhood without even money for an Uber. And oh, what an embarrassing oversight. I seem to have run out of weeks in the year before I could get around to Smash Brothers Ultimate. Oh well, it's a new year after all. Let's move on from the past and focus on what the future will bring. Fuck. So Smash Brothers on the Wii U came out and the usual suspects all scurried at my garden path waving it, but I slammed the door and went, sorry, much as I'd love to join you in Nintendo's paddling pool full of self-satisfied cum, there's no single player content, so damn, hands tied, if only I liked multiplayer games and wasn't quite so good at alienating people. So now of course Smash Brothers Ultimate comes out with a story mode and I can't use that excuse anymore. Back up the garden path they come. Oh please review Smash Ultimate, Yahtzee, please, 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 there's a story mode. Look, it's not really my thing, alright? Oh please review it anyway, everyone else is talking about it, we'd love to hear your take. Fine, here's my take. Ugh, we didn't like your take, you shouldn't have reviewed it if it wasn't your thing. For fuck's sake! Actually, Smash Brothers has a close equivalent to that with Bayonetta, and sure enough little of that character's actual personality is conveyed. She's even depicted with realistic human proportions, which kind of threw me. Without legs like an unfolded stepladder, she just looks like that one friend of your mum who kept wanting to hang out with you when you were a kid because she was still single at 34 and the ticking of her biological clock had become as loud as a malfunctioning lawnmower engine. Unlocked spirits convey various buffs and you swap them out before each battle to best counter your opponent, and the whole Nintendo characters crossover remit which was already getting shaky with the guest characters is now officially in the bin because the spirits are from all over the place. You've got Shantae, Rayman, the chicks from Fatal Frame, blimey Nintendo's in bed with a lot of people, it's gonna end up with a snatch like an inside out pink ski sock. So for a while I was struggling along not having much fun but everything abruptly changed after I unlocked Donkey Kong, who I proceeded to exclusively play as. Why? Because A he's big and cartoony enough that you can actually read his fucking movements, and B he has this one attack that I like to call fuck off I win, oog oog, where he slaps the ground and everyone in a ten yard radius explodes. I ended up challenging myself not to use it because I jerk off sailors for nickels and even I thought it was cheap. In all seriousness now, Grrr is of course a very beautiful game with haunting arty watercolour style backgrounds, a very good soundtrack and what looks like hand drawn animation as smooth as a virginal college boy's hand moving across a frustrated cougar's thigh. But then actual control was given to me and I'd push right only for the character's beautifully animated walk cycle to glide across the ground like I'm dragging an icon across a windows desktop and that sums up my issue with this very artistic and emotional experience that its eyes keep glazing over whenever it has to address the whole video game thing. Let's go back to that steam blur. Is a serene experience free of danger, frustration, or death. Listen here, clever tits. Locking myself in a fucking bathroom with a paper bag on my head would also be a serene experience free of danger and adversity, but I wouldn't base a game around it. You indie emotional experiences and walking simulators need to stop being so fucking sniffy about gameplay. Challenge is the tool by which video games pace themselves and direct the player's attention. And frankly, I found to be very boring. Yes, a good story can be challenging in its own way, but what's the story here? A sad person wants to be less sad, not exactly American History X, is it? I'd like to address now Ashen's most significant feature, the multiplayer. I'd like to, but sadly I have no fucking clue if I participated in it or not. How it works is you have an NPC support character most of the time as you explore and if another player happens to be around pursuing the same quest then they seamlessly take over your support character. Consequently a lot of the game is designed around co-op, Dark Souls combat is best suited to one-on-one -on -one fighting but the enemy almost exclusively ambushes in groups and support is vital. But either I never ran into another player or the game had assessed my combat skill and decided to exclusively matchmake me with the severely mentally disabled. I wouldn't mind an NPC that just stood still and drew aggro while playing with their belly buttons, but they're just competent enough that you start relying on them until you wade confidently into a battle and glance back to see them a hundred yards behind taking undue interest in a shelf bracket. I gave up on Ashen altogether after my 17th failed attempt to get through a long boring dungeon trying to keep my support character alive, only to watch them thrust a bit too eagerly and plop off the walkway yet again. Hi, I'm Yahtzee Crozier, super casual game reviewer. What's that games industry? No new games of interest? That's cool. We're all super cash here, have a fun sized Twix. Katamari Damacy was a quirky Japanese game from 2004, and there's no quirk like Japanese quirk. Gosh, the Japanese are quirky, aren't they? Just look up Unit 731. Even Japan's atrocities are quirky. Hey, that's not where a human arm goes! You start off with pathetic, laughable sticky balls that can just about pick up drawing pins and which get gleefully batted about by the cats that patrol the living room, but then a few minutes later after you're done hoovering up the garden furniture you come back and there's something very rewarding about seeing an exclamation mark appear above the head of a cat that once bullied you. I see you remember me, Mr. Whiskers. After all, what good are sticky balls? 
if you can't crush pussy. Shortly things get completely out of hand and you move on to rolling up people, then cars, then buildings, and eventually continents and Godzillas. Presumably an awful lot of people die horribly when those Katamaris get turned into stars, but hey, there's nothing quite so super cash as a few consequence-free murders. Boy, Yahtzee, you sure have opinions on Katamari Damacy, you must have played this a lot back in the day. You might want to put tea strainers over your ears, listener, because this will blow your mind. I'd never played Katamari Damacy before. Donut County was an indie game from last year that had a similar vibe to Katamari, except instead of a big sticky ball which gets bigger as things attached to it, like what makes sense, you get a hole that moves around and gets bigger as more things fall in it. And how does that work, Donut County? Does every single loose object in this town carry a little pickaxe? Are we supposed to believe this is some kind of magic hole for wizards? Why is everyone stupider than me? Donut County has its merits, it's got a stronger story aspect, but it has no challenge, so it's a one and done two hour distraction, where Katamari's meatier gameplay and jaunty soundtrack makes it almost endlessly replayable. Besides, who'd want a hole when you can have sticky balls, am I right fellas? I'm very lonely. It has occasionally been difficult to tell how much of Suda51 actually is in the games that have been sold to us as Suda51 games, but I think it's fair to say he was pretty invested in Travis Strikes again, what with it being about 90% references to previous Suda51 properties and a 10% fun and engaging video game. It's not so much another installment of the No More Heroes series as an intermediary episode, it's the quick game of Trivial Pursuit held early in the evening to gauge interest in the full on sex orgy you've penciled in for 9 o'clock. So if there isn't sufficient interest in No More Heroes 3, then Suda's gonna find himself in a room full of confused friends in a spotlessly clean gimp suit, and Travis Strikes Again is gonna fall pretty fucking flat since it culminates in a teaser for No More Heroes 3, but then it also contains a teaser for a sequel to Shadows of the Damned, so at least Suda's hedging his bets. I think I'd definitely play a sequel to Shadows of the Damned, I mean, if you heard that someone you knew had died from attempting to swallow an entire set of snooker balls and the cues, then you'd probably want to see the corpse for yourself. Yes, remember how hilarious it was in the first No More Heroes when you had to wank the controller to recharge your sword? You'll have plenty of opportunities to relive that classic comedy moment because your weapon in Travis Strikes Again has the battery life of a fucking six year old iPhone. And it's not so much wanking as a complex act of stimulation upon a very uptight and picky clitoris. I'm growing to hate the standard Switch controller analog sticks. You need to press one of them in to do the recharge move, and there seems to be a difference of millimeters between pressing it in and pressing it up. So I'll be trying to recharge my weapon in the heat of battle, and Travis will suddenly realize he's late for smashing his face into the nearest wall. So I was already iffy on the RE2 make, because the very idea is what we call a mouthful of dinner plate, because it makes me do this. And then reviews started coming in, and virtually all of them praise it for being true to the original, and that made the dinner plate double in size. Then I played through Resident Evil 2, both bits of it, and I can state with resounding certainty that it's all right. This is the part where all the cockthroats swoop down on the comments like flies to a dead dog and go, ooh, an all right from Yahtzee is high praise anywhere else, buzz buzz, eat that dead dog's last panicky burst of diuretic shit, cockthroats. The intro really emphasises the increase of scope from zombie infested mansion to zombie infested city as the camera pulls back to reveal a dense network of chaotic streets that form together into the Resident Evil 2 logo. Very nicely done, just a shame that the subsequent game takes place almost entirely in a single building. All right, fine, there's a secret laboratory as well, but come on, every Resident Evil game has one of those. If you're gonna count that as a location, you might as well count the fucking options menu. What's that on your face, Mr. Zombie? Blam! Oh, it's the skirting board. What I don't like so much is the big indestructible neck beard in a trench coat and fedora who pursues you relentlessly from room to room because you made the mistake of admitting that you liked an anime once and now he won't leave you alone until he's shown you his entire Blu-ray collection. I get that once we've gone over the hallways enough times to start getting familiar, we need something to keep us unnerved, and he certainly does that as his massive pocky inflated bulk stomps towards you making all the walls shake, but over time he becomes more annoying than scary, like those Silent Hill 4 ghosts that keep nibbling your bum and play playing the stereos too loud while you're trying to get the exploration and puzzle solving done. Eventually you realise that his mum told him he can't follow you into certain rooms, so I duck into a safe room and listen to his thundering footsteps echo through the building, not having a chuffing clue where the fucker actually is, then I'll pop my head out and oh he's right outside, boring a licker to death with his opinions on Sword Art Online 2. Back in the safe room. This isn't creepy survival horror, this is a mailman trying to negotiate with an angry dog in a front yard. Hey I'm gonna ride my bike to another city to see if my brother is at the police station. Did you try phoning the police station? Uh... Hey, I'm gonna make a virus that transforms people into gigantic super strong monsters for military applications. How would that be more efficient than just dropping a big bomb? Uh... And anyway, wouldn't it violate the square cube law? Uh... Oh, never mind. Just spit out the dinner plate. I'm not into Disney or Final Fantasy, not being a child or an overweight female cosplayer who has never once in their life been able to come, so I've steered clear of Kingdom Hearts, but I admit I was curious about Kingdom Hearts 3. The series has a high profile, and some people I would never admit to respecting say they like it. The same people have also said that the plot is completely fucking incomprehensible if you haven't played Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, Chain of Memories, Birth by Sleep, Dream Drop Distance, and every other side game with a subtitle that reads like a bag of marbles fell on a keyboard with an overzealous autocorrect. So I gave Kingdom Hearts 3 a chance, and you know what, viewer, sometimes you totally 
totally should go with your first instinct. Things started okay. You are Sora, anime protagonist in a big Disney crossover multiverse with some kind of slightly unclear peacekeeping role. I assume he's the equivalent of a police officer because his job seems to largely entail beating the shit out of black people. Ha ha. Who are all these other characters? Why is Mickey Mouse knocking about a black desert with the Muppet Babies version of Sephiroth? Who are all the dudes in black coats and why don't any of them know how zip fasteners work? Sora's motive keeps changing. Sometimes we're getting his lost power back, sometimes we're looking for three missing warriors, sometimes we're looking for Roxas, who is in Sora's heart, which he already knew, so why the fuck is he looking? Or we're just generally opposing the main bad guys, who were three versions of the same dude, and none of them could figure out how zips work either. The story of Kingdom Hearts 3 made me angry. Not Liam Neeson angry, more teaching Facebook to your grandma angry. But it wasn't so much my lack of story background as the way the story was told. Here is my impression of a Kingdom Hearts character going to the toilet. Ooh, what is it? I think I need the toilet. Hmm. Hey look, isn't that a toilet over there? Right, let's get going. Break into a sprint, bloke in a black trench coat appears, everyone stops dead. I wouldn't do that if I were you. What? The organisation? Why shouldn't we go to the toilet? Simply because. I just did a very big poo in that toilet. Ha <laughs> ha! Gorsh, if he did a very big poo in the toilet, it probably still smells. It doesn't matter. Hmm. As long as we're together, we can take on the smell of any poo. That's what friendship is all about. Imagine this conversation happening several times an hour, and some of it is in a Donald Duck voice. I didn't expect to finish Kingdom Hearts 3 in the time I had, so I just set out to play until I knew my opinion wasn't going to change, and that moment came at the Winnie the Pooh section. In between two of the actual levels, it suddenly becomes important that Sora investigate why he's not on the cover of a Winnie the Pooh book. Wasn't sure why he felt he should be, except his general sense of being the centre of the fucking universe, but we go to the Hundred Acre Wood and it turns out everything's fine and they just wanted to hang out. Out. Although they won't let you leave until you've played some insipid colour matching games. Sorry, why was this important? Is the plot seriously being held hostage by Winnie the fucking Pooh? In conclusion, Kingdom Hearts 3 is a fucking baffling experience. Equal parts impenetrable and insufferably condescendingly twee, with a creepy undercurrent of Disney thought control. Kind of like trying to get off with Mary Poppins in a Scientology test centre. The Big Crunch theory of the universe states that all matter will eventually collapse into a dimensionless singularity in a single point in space. I have a similar theory of video games called the Big Arsing About in a Bush theory, which states that all video Video game franchises will eventually gravitate to open world games set in the wilderness with stealth and resource management, meaning that the gameplay will centre around arsing about in a bush. Bonus points if it's post-apocalyptic as well. Zelda did it, Tomb Raider did it, God of War's giving it some funny looks, and those were all at one point from three vastly different genres. So what's next on the hit list? How about claustrophobic survival horror shooters about depressed Russians? And maybe after that we could airdrop Cooking Mama into the Cambodian jungle where she has to craft a bow and arrow out of her fucking salad servers. Cue Metro Exodus. Metro Exodus is the third and possibly last game in the Metro 2033 series in which the last remnants of humanity in a frozen irradiated world eke out a claustrophobic existence in the metro tunnels beneath Moscow and must deal with political tensions, mutant monsters and a subtle paranormal undercurrent. Now take all the parts of that last sentence and arrange them nicely in a big bin, because none of them are true by the end of Metro Exodus. Artyom, ongoing serious protagonist with a highly specialised anxiety disorder that means he can only speak on loading screens, is making a bad habit of going up to the surface and twiddling with his radio knobs while everyone keeps telling him he might as well be looking for chocolate raisins in a rabbit hutch, but he eventually discovers the hidden truth that parts of the world besides Moscow are still inhabited and inhabited. In fact, most of it is, apparently. And Moscow's just been deliberately isolated by paranoid militants this whole time. Now, I'd never be so hyperbolic as to say that this fundamentally ruins the Metro series, or pisses on it, or leaves its hollowed out corpse in an alley with an asshole like a rusty tuber, but it does mean that if I get around to replaying the first two Metros, I'm going to feel pretty fucking stupid throughout, as I appreciate the horrific lonely atmosphere of a dead world and the uplifting moments of pure humanity in a seemingly hopeless situation, now knowing that there are fucking beach parties going on half an hour up the motorway. I relished the between mission bits on the train, where we can hear extensive dialogues and watch everyone hang out and see how their personalities differentiate these interchangeable Russians with heads like potatoes, although the dialogue has a bad habit of signalling upcoming twists. We just have to get inside this one mysteriously silent bunker and everything will be fine and we'll get medals and free food and a pony. Oh I'm so optimistic for the future, if only I could <coughs> shake this conspicuous non-specific cough. Shit's about to get fucky! We're in an area controlled by a religious cult that worships a giant mutant fish. Are we gonna fight the mutant fish at the end or liberate the cultists from brainwashing? No, we just sort of bugger off. Then we're in the Mad Max level where a bandit gang has enslaved a local indigenous tribe. Do we liberate the slaves? Not really. We do set the ball rolling on that, but instead of seeing it through, we just sort of bugger off. Then we're in the nice river valley level where we were hoping to set up home, but find it crawling with weird survivalist forest people. Do we kill them all or learn to coexist? No. Because then we get to the end of the valley and notice the dam's about to burst. Do we get to see it burst? Or rescue the forest people? No. We just point it out to them, say, shit's about to get fucky, and then bugger off. The smug charismatic psycho du jour, the twins, are definitely among the least effective or interesting villains Far Cry has produced 
interviews, they come across like former stars of a 90s children's sitcom who went off the deep end. Certainly hateable, but with no complexity or agenda besides wanting to laze around living off other people's hard work. Bloody typical of young people today, am I right? The only reason the twins have any power seems to be that people like the main protagonist keep getting inexplicable brain farts in their presence. There's one bit where we're heading to a building to confront the twins and the twins give us a ring when we're outside and say, hey, put all your guns in that bag and then come in and hang up yourself to the ceiling. And we're given no choice but to obey. Hypothesise with me, Captain Protagonist person, what if we just didn't do that? What possible consequence do you think there would be of bursting in guns blazing? Oh no, they might say something very fucking sassy before I blow their jawbones off with an LMG and leave their tongues to waggle like used condoms on an extractor fan. New Dawn, are you slightly blatantly locking important things behind rare crafting resource grinderthons in the hope that I'll notice the fucking massive link to the micropayment shop on the pause menu? No, of course not, don't be absurd. Why, are you interested? Well, haha, maybe I'll not get all the upgrades and call it a skill run. Well, haha, you need to upgrade your base to unlock all the story missions. Well, haha, stick it up your bum! New Dawn gives me a profound sense of, oh, how lovely you shouldn't have. There's a temptation to mouth the usual completely unnecessary statements like, if you liked Far Cry 5, you'll want to check out New Dawn, but I feel in this case that would be like saying, if you like squirrels, you'll want to check out this quilt I made out of roadkill. Well, now that you've spent all that money getting the Star Wars license, we did make Knights of the Old Republic back in the day, so perhaps we could- But no, hate Star Wars! Star Wars is boring, cancel all the Star Wars. I want that! You want what? I want that! What, Destiny? Yes, I want thing that looks like Halo with somehow even less personality. Well, you can't have Destiny, it's owned by Activision Blizzard. <laughs> alright, alright. I suppose we could make something that's a lot like Destiny. I mean, mindless online-only looty shooties aren't really our thing, we're more about character-based role-playing. Oh dear, please stop holding your breath, EA. Look, we made our own version of Destiny, it's called Anthem. Ugh, I hate it, you're all fired. Why didn't you make a Star Wars game? I'm sure the writers have done a lot of world-building while doodling on the backs of their exercise books, but all that you actually need to know is humans yay, everyone else boo, and there's your common or garden all-powerful ancient artifact somewhere that you have to stop the bad guys getting to and making whoosh crikey lasers come out of, which would presumably be bad. But let's not gloss over the story, because Anthem is a game of two parts that are forced to live together in a state of open hostility like Israel and Palestine, although Israel and Palestine have never tried to flog loot boxes to Lebanon. Meanwhile, show up at Gameplay Land and ask if it would be possible to play single player and the game reacts like you sat down in an expensive restaurant and ordered a bowl of cornflakes. You go to the privacy settings, once you can find the fucking things, because this game has a worse menu system than a McDonald's drive through after a major earthquake. What is it with ultra AAA games having shitty interfaces these days? Is it the same principle by which Las Vegas casinos are laid out to get you lost and unable to glimpse the sun in the hope that you get confused and accidentally drop all your money, and your options are public match, as God intended, or private match for big stupid losers. Then when you set it to private and try to start solo, a window pops up saying, ha <laughs> sorry, someone's clearly made a dreadful mistake, surely you don't actually want to play a solo private match. Just click here and we'll set it back to public play so you can rejoin all the normal people. But I didn't click that, and then the tip on the fucking loading screen was something about how playing multiplayer earns more rewards and doesn't make the little baby Jesus cry. What the fuck is this, guys? Am I on suicide watch? The gameplay clearly exists on sufferance, and yet the main story is still surprisingly short and padded out. The bit where you can't continue the plot until you complete a checklist of arbitrary gameplay grinds springs to mind. A very poorly explained checklist at that. Get five multi-kills. What the fuck's a multi-kill, Anthem? Well, what do you think it is? Uh, killing more than two enemies with one grenade? Oh, good guess. Wrong, though. Ah, the long-awaited Crackdown 3. Well, frankly, while it has been close to a decade since the last crackdown, and 13 years since the last crackdown that didn't suck mouthfuls of used baby wipes from a blocked sewer drain, I'm not sure it's fair to say that anyone's been awaiting another one. I was content to forget about it and recycle the relevant brain cells to think of more inventive ways to look down ladies' tops without them noticing, but nevertheless Crackdown 3 has appeared. And it's a very appropriate title. Down, because that's how it makes me feel. Crack, because anyone involved with it is going to lose all their teeth and end up sucking dick behind the bus station. And 3, which sounds a bit like we. So the intro diligently fails to satisfactorily establish why we hate the and instead spends most of its time establishing that Terry Crews is in this game. And God bless his little cotton socks, probably thought he was going to be in more of it, but then he's killed off in the crash, and largely disappears from the situation, while the surviving agent of our choice watches up ashore and hooks up with a local resistance movement of wholesome idealistic young people. The game proper then begins, and if you played Crackdown 1, slipped on a puddle of your own brackish mung, fell into a coma and only just woke up in time to play Crackdown 3, you could be forgiven for thinking that in the intervening time the game's industry had advanced no further than a shit-smeared dildo at a relay race. You might might be a little confused, if, like me, you remember seeing a hype video for Crackdown 3 a year or two back that showed off a fully destructible city, which would have been enough USP for a modern sandbox, but it turns out that that's only for the multiplayer mode. Which makes sense, it wouldn't really work in the story campaign, it'd be hard to have an epic final boss fight if you've already blown up the final boss arena and converted the rubble into a custom-made Japanese zen garden. The only time I felt really challenged was during one of the later boss fights against a dude in a giant mech, and that was just frustrating. He spawns too many helpers to keep track of, all with hitscan weapons and in an arena with no cover, but after seven failed 
attempts, I realised that I could jump out of a window, cling to the side of the building where they couldn't reach me, and wait ten minutes for my health to come back. Yeah, I'd say that's cheaper than a baby bird with Tourette syndrome. Hey, I'm just using the tools that are available. Blame whoever left this window open, which must have been Crackdown's last semblance of marketability as it was committing suicide. You know, I could have reviewed Devil May Cry 5 this week. I didn't for three reasons. Firstly, contempt for my fellow man, as usual. Second, release drought has got to hit sooner or later, so it's wiser to keep your nest feathered. And third, Square Enix put out Left Alive and hoped I wouldn't notice. Left Alive is bad, have no doubt, but it's not the usual boring badness, i.e. the same hacked out shit is always callously designed to wring from the mentally disadvantaged the money that their schools and workplaces give them if they promise not to show up. It's the much more interesting for my purposes, bafflingly horribly designed bad, that some idiot actually published. Come on, Square Enix, you're old enough to know better. What happened to the sterling business minds that published… hmm. If I gave you money, would you go away? Left Alive is about a haunting vision of the future in which two parts of Russia, populated mysteriously by people with American accents, decide to call themselves silly names and declare war on each other, with the focus being on some individuals from the less shitty country, struggling to survive in a city occupied by the more shitty country as the occupiers move to exterminate everyone non-shitty. I'll spare us the detailed plot summary, AJP Taylor, just tell us what kind of game it is. Do you know, audience? I'm not sure. I could tell you what it isn't. It isn't very good. It all starts when you get near the enemy, and you will know about it because the computer voice goes, the enemy are approaching every fucking time, like a forgetful sat-nav. So you get into cover, as long as you press the button when you were within the regulation half centimetre from the cover and didn't do a flying somersault into the open instead. You poke your head out the side of cover to observe the guards, at which point a guard goes, oh look, it's someone's head, everyone gets alerted and you get shot fifty times in the body. Granted, yes, that would happen in real life, but I've grown used to a sort of gentlemanly etiquette where stealth game cover systems are concerned, but it's in the subsequent conflict that the big brains come out to flex. I chucked a molotov and the enemy screamed and ran away from the fire, then ran straight back into it to double check that it was the thing making his eyeballs melt. At another time I was pinned down in an alley behind a box with no means of escape and the seventeen guards that were pinning me down just stopped firing and wandered off, presumably because they hit the union mandated thirty second alertness cap. At other times after popping out I couldn't tell if a soldier was still unalerted or if he'd had a little Alzheimer's brain fart and forgotten how to move or shoot. Those Alzheimer's brain farts can be contagious too. At one point I was escorting a lady and when she was barely six feet from the shelter, incidentally yeah, let's put refugees in obvious inescapable holes in the ground, in the middle of occupied territory. I'm sure they'll be just fucking dandy. When she caught a whiff of enemy fart and immediately screamed and hugged the ground. Then like six enemy soldiers all came over and clustered around her like a rugby scrum, possibly to compare notes on how to make their guns fire. The precise moment where it all came crashing down for me was when I found a hidden document that displayed a piece of flavoured text, stating that the city council rejected a proposal to overhaul the sewer system. In that moment, the scales fell from my eyes. What the fuck am I doing here? Why the fuck am I reading this? Flavoured text? Only in the sense that plain is a flavour of crisp, Devil May Cry is a <sighs> character action game and direct sequel Devil May Cry 1 through 4, in which case may I be the first to welcome Ninja Theory's attempted reboot, DMC Devil May Cry, to the dustbin of history. I hope you have a good time in there hanging out with the Star Wars expanded universe and most of the Halloween films. DMC 5 is so keen to bring back the previous canon it's almost being slightly aggressive about it. Old Dante's back, looking like a member of Metallica after a near fatal bleaching accident, as well as Nero from DMC 4. Yes, the whiny teenage replacement protagonist that nobody liked. He's back with a robot arm and he's going to keep coming back with more robot parts until you do like him. That's right, we're doing the full ride in on this bitch. And let's have every other established character appear as well, even if they've got fuck all to do. Trish and Lady will both appear, they will get beaten up, flash their naked bodies precisely once each, and then spend the rest of the game sitting in the back of the van like two old mattresses you haven't gotten around to taking to the dump. You'll be disappointed if you play DMC5 for the plot. The story really falls apart by the end, after all the reveals are revealed and the last few chapters descend into something halfway between Dragon Ball Z and Days of Our Lives. You'll also be disappointed if you're some kind of interior designer bereft of inspiration and are playing it for the scenery, because large chunks of it are just navigating one washed out ruined corridor after another, that only serve to connect the fights rather than enhance them. But the combat at least will give you what you want, especially if what you want is variety. It's still unlocking new weapons and fighting styles right up to the final mission. Frankly I find that a bit obnoxious, when the game throws the mystical nunchucks at me when I still haven't gotten to grips with the Cerberus testicle bowlers and the double-ended salad tongs of Toshwa Hay, to say nothing of when we switch playable characters and have to change to a completely different set of combat controls which is like suddenly having to learn to wank with the other hand. But I guess you're supposed to keep practicing, that's why it follows the usual DMC tradition of having about 9 million super hard difficulty settings that just keep unlocking and unlocking into the stratosphere. Devotion has some puzzling and infusion of Taiwanese culture that elevates it marginally above a typical walking simulator, but none of this matters because you can't have it. Yes, it's been removed from Steam because one of the textures or particle effects or something was interpreted as critical of the Chinese government, and the developers took it down because they didn't want to be black bagged. Depressing as it is that this sort of thing can happen in 20 fucking 19, I do think it was a bit of an overreaction on Red Candle Games' part to rush out a sequel so quickly that they didn't even spell the name right, and also to move to Sweden and change their names to Massive Entertainment. 
So a repetitive open-world pseudo-tactical third-person cover shooter might seem about as far away from a small-scale first-person linear adventure as you can get, but as we settle into the primary gameplay loop of The Devotion 2, we see precisely how it intends to carry on the series' legacy of staring existential horror. As you connect with a safe house and a list of numbered objectives appear in the corner of the screen, knowing that all of them will entail the exact same thing, walking into yet another exhaustively decorated large room full of chest-high walls, taking up position and waiting for another parade of identical generic bad guys to inexplicably leap out of cover in turn so you can pop them in the face, and then you will grasp the true horror of your existence that you willingly paid money to play what is essentially a right-wing gun enthusiast version of 52 pickup for potentially the rest of your life. And in that, The Devotion 2 is a true sequel to the previous- what, what do you want? Well what is it a sequel to then? What, the boring one? Actually that does make more sense. Sorry everyone, little misunderstanding, I'll have to start again. <clears throat> Boring Tom Clancy Ubisoft Sandbox 2 is another The Division. Oh bugger, I've confused myself. Hey, fuck society, live for yourself. Yeah. Come join our society that opposes society. Yeah. Now put on this uniform and lay down your lives by the hundreds for extremely minor gains. What? Now obviously having played through Dark Souls more times than I've willingly vacuumed my own carpet, when I review a new game by From Software, Dark Souls is going to come up a lot. But even I get bored of saying the name over and over again, so how about this? Every time I want to say Dark Souls, I'll instead say the name of a James Bond film, and we'll see if I can get through them all by the end of the video. That'll add some much needed gaiety to the upcoming whinge. So then, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is a new game by From Software, the developers of Dr. No, set in a slightly fantasised version of Feudal Japan and which has been making Neo, Team Ninja's version of From Russia With Love, set in a slightly fantasised version of Feudal Japan, slowly sink to its knees and frustratedly bang its head on the floor. The plot is, you are Wolf, a lone feudal Japanese warrior who should be really fucking grateful there was no such thing as copyright in the days of lone feudal Japanese warriors, who was the personal shinobi to a little prince boy before the prince boy gets captured as part of a power struggle and the wolf has to go rescue him after the power struggle also struggles one of his arms off. It's surprisingly easy to understand for a From Software game. If this were You Only Live Twice, I'd have expected to need three playthroughs and an afternoon with a wiki to have grasped that much, but here we find another way Sekiro is different to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. The main character is a character, so you can't customise them or change armour or sword, but on the bright side they can actually converse with other characters and don't just gormlessly stand there while a highly suspect dude with a concealed face laughs maniacally about nothing in particular. See, this is the thing, listener, I sort of have to compare Sekiro to The Spy Who Loved Me in order to understand why I, a card-carrying fan of Moonraker, don't like Sekiro as much. Shocked gasp, someone faints, questions asked at Parliament. Sekiro has taken to stealth focus like a befuddled old grandpa who just discovered MP3 players and is now on a quest to share this wonderful new concept with the world. So it's got enhanced verticality, meaning unlike in Never Say Never Again, the jump controls are more intuitive and responsive than a dead hamster at the bottom of a sack of Christmas lights. You have a grappling hook to put yourself in ideal positions for backstabs and drop kills, and there are icons to show when an enemy is ready for one, as well as awareness indicators. So we can sabotage our lovely scenery with ugly icons just like all those other games you like. So is Sekiro a game that would appeal to the Living Daylights fans? Honestly, I'd almost recommend it more to non-licensed to kill fans who don't have prior expectations. Your mileage may vary, but I didn't find it as interesting as Goldeneye, or as creative as Tomorrow Never Dies, or as fun as The World Is Not Enough. Oh, die another day, Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace. I'm sick of hearing about Skyfall, Yards. Can we please move on? No, we can't. Spectre. Alright, now we can. Naming the characters is easy, there's almost always one moment where another character loudly greets them by name as they enter a room, like they're a fucking special guest star on The Simpsons, and there was more than one occasion where the killer turned out to be the guy with the obvious creepy psycho voice. I didn't get much deductive challenge out of Unheard, is me point. It felt more like constantly moving inexorably towards success the more I listened to, and the scenarios all feel so very contrived, partly because it seems odd that everyone in the building should be having incredibly relevant exposition-heavy dialogues throughout the entire five minutes up to the incident, when you'd think at least some of them would just be talking about lunch or going to the toilet, partly because the actors were apparently all told that this was their big chance to get out of radio ads and the theme park mascot costumes and finally get into big time shit like anime dubs and softcore porn, so they're all doing massively overblown performances with their best Bugsy Malone accents. Truth be told, I probably wouldn't have given outward much of my time if it weren't for two things I found intriguing. First of all, you start the game, wake up in your nice bed, yawn, stretch, put on your jeans, head out the door and then a crowd of people on your doorstep call you a cunt. Well, that would have livened up the start of Chrono Trigger, or basically any Pokemon game. Not only do they think you're a cunt, but you've got five days to pay 150 silver and if you can't pony up they're going to burn down your house or something. And that's how you get to grips with the game, by immediately having to go out and find a way to pay off the local neighbourhood watch come protection racket. I'm also not a fan of the way you never truly die. It's a fairly universal measure of a game's frustration, how long it takes after failure to get back in a position to have another crack. And this game's like, oh no you died, never mind, just have a six hour rest to get your health back, scavenge up more food and water, figure out where the fuck we just spawned you, and then trek back over. Or I could reload 
code a save. No, you fucking couldn't. We literally won't let you. And I don't feel enough sense of purpose to mitigate the annoyance. So in conclusion, Outward doesn't go anywhere and Unheard won't shut up. Next week, a game called Piers Morgan about a human being who deserves to be alive. Anyway, the Yoshis are on their island, continuing their carefree lives of skipping about saying bum a lot, when baby Bowser, who seems to be really struggling for things to fill his time with in these days before puberty hits and he takes an interest in date rape, decides to steal their five magical gems and one of the Yoshis has to go across the world gathering them all up again because, I don't know, someone wrote all the Netflix passwords on them. Look, you have to gather the gems because if you didn't you wouldn't get to play the video game. The plot hardly matters. Although someone should have explained that to the cutscene writer. I must confess, listeners, that I'm a little bit biased against Yoshi's Island and its present day derivatives. Of all the chapters of what we might as well call the original Mario canon, I like Yoshi's Island the least. Not just because listening to Baby Mario cry made me want to vaccinate him against continuing to be alive, not just because of the questionable way in which Yoshi would swallow enemies and then poo them out of his implied cloaca, not even because the aiming controls were shit, and still are shit, despite the no longer having the excuse that the controller isn't full of unused buttons and analogue sticks, all hankering to muck in like a bunch of guilt-stricken white people at an African house-building project. No, the main reason Yoshi's Island sits poorly with me is that it introduced to a hitherto perfectly straightforward series of platformers the idea that there can be degrees of success. All it took was for one cunt to realise that that sense of fulfilment one gets from the level 100% completed jingle is something people might conceivably pay extra for. A cunt who will one day be remembered alongside the dude who fucked the monkey that gave us AIDS. Mummy, can I watch this funny internet video about my favourite Yoshi game? Of course, darling, there's hardly likely to be a reference to the dude that fucked the monkey that gave us AIDS. And if Mortal Kombat does have superhero comics disease, then it appears to have entered its terminal stage, as it's officially having its own crisis on infinite earths. To put that another way, the official message of Mortal Kombat 11 story mode is fuck continuity and fuck anyone who was invested in it. You probably should have known not to get invested after MK9, I mean any franchise that so openly and deliberately flushes its entire canon down the toilet is almost certainly going to keep doing it, and indeed the end point of the MK11 story mode all but states that not only is everything reset yet again, but no future continuity is going to have any permanence either. You might have noticed the internet had one of its idiosyncratic opposite sides of the monkey cage poo flinging contests over the netherrealm lads saying they're not going to put all their female characters in bikinis anymore, because it's silly and impractical. Which it is, granted, but I noticed that most of these ostensibly more practically minded dressers are still wearing stiletto heels, and as for silly, of all the silly things about Mortal Kombat this seems a very arbitrary place to start, rather than say, noob cybot talking like Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. Scorpion gets heel face turned yet again because the dude's a fucking weather vane on a merry-go-round, and shows up at the good guy's hideout and obviously they don't believe him because what is the story mode if not one ridiculously contrived reason for a punch up after another? So after Scorpion successfully beats the snot out of a couple of them, he says, Wait, you misunderstand my intentions. Oh, did we, Mr. Scorpion? Forgive me. I thought you were making your intentions perfectly clear about ten seconds ago when you rammed two daggers into my eye sockets and then power bombed me into the floor so they burst out the back of my head. But clearly I was jumping to conclusions and you were only trying to give me emergency cataract surgery. And then there's a stealthy bit, because that's just what a high speed drug fueled katana bisectathon needs a bit of hiding in a cupboard with a sushi roll up my ass, waiting for a gap in the guard patrol route, multiple sargasms, and it's flat out fucking broken because sometimes the guard's positions reset in such a way that there are no gaps in the patrol routes and you run out the stage time limit waiting for the fat gits to stop farting visibility cones at the only door. I say stealth section, you're perfectly free to give everyone a wazakashi prostate massage but my transparently evil handler told me not to kill anyone, so obviously I tried to do that because otherwise the level's completely fucking trivial and a game without challenge is like fucking your own dog. Where's the thrill of sexual conquest? He's right there and up until this point trusted you. Days Gone is painfully generic. Thanks for watching this week's Zero Punctuation, see you next time. That was 40 hours of my life well fucking spent. They should have called Days Gone Verbal Tick the game. Maybe it's more naturalistic to pepper every line with ums and errs and stutters and flubs, but it's so fucking exhausting to listen to. And Deacon St. John is the verbal tickiest of them all. Constantly, uh, talking like he's just woken up and is working a, a kink out of his back and... <sighs> Really can't be bothered with your bullshit right now. And another thing, stop second guessing my intentions, Deacon St. John. I walk two feet out of a zombie clear out zone to get a better look at it, and you go, Oh, I guess I'll finish clearing it out later then. You'd like that, wouldn't you, you lazy bastard? At the start of the game, Deacon divides his time between two survivor camps, neither of which he wants to officially join because he'd rather spend his mornings lying in watching MTV, like the total fuckhead he is. One camp will sell him weapons and the other has bike upgrades, but one is run by slavers and the other by weirdo truthers still calling for the rotting corpse of Barack Obama's birth certificate. So 
deciding which one to support is a semi-interesting dilemma. Until that is, you unlock the third camp, which has weapons and bike upgrades and is run by a large friendly golden retriever. So that initial conflict disappears unfulfilled from the game like a bloke losing his nerve and speed walking out of a brothel. So the plot centres around the nice camp for a while and seems to be coming to a natural conclusion until we suddenly have to leave and go to a completely different camp full of completely different characters in a locked off part of the map for another eight hours of game. Get to the plopping point! Stop me if this starts to sound familiar. In an alternative late 19th, early 20th century style setting, a lone adventurer in the middle of the ocean arrives at the doorstep of an isolated high-tech electropunk city, founded by a charismatic visionary and populated by the world's best and brightest, promised a place where they could work without fear of regulation and be entitled to the sweat of their brow and all that. But as soon as we get in, we find it seemingly deserted and more littered with bodies than a corridor in a hall of residence at about 2am on the first night of spring break. Shortly, the two or three remaining survivors contact us by radio, including the charismatic visionary himself, who initially takes us for a spy, and our goal is to escape, determining on the way what precisely befell this failed utopia. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yes, it's quite hauntingly reminiscent of Jet Set Willy. I mean Bioshock. On multiple occasions it's hinted that you yourself will at some point travel back in time to the present and you're dealing with situations that your future self has in some way instigated. But then the game ends and none of that happens. Don't do that, story writers. You're only supposed to leave loose threads to fuel the sequel, not the entire resolution of the fucking plot. It's like bringing someone halfway to orgasm, then going away for six months, coming back, finishing the job and saying, aren't you lucky you had an orgasm that lasted six months, if you follow me. Help me out here, Bethesda. Why does Rage 2 have to exist? Actually, before you answer that, remind me, why did Rage 1 have to exist? Because all Rage 1 was in retrospect was a rather unmemorable little sidetrack that meant we couldn't have Doom 2016 for another few years, like an extremely long queue outside a cake and blowjob shop. So Rage 1 was a puddingy fart in an overcrowded swimming pool and Bethesda must have said to id, alright fine, just make Doom. So they made Doom and it kicked ass and then they were like, great we've figured it out, now let's make another Rage. Why? Why are we still bothering with Rage? But as is so often the case when something that works well for a linear shooter is put in an open world sandbox setting, Rage 2 has an issue with pacing. In the same way that I have an issue with my uncomfortably large 12 inch knob because Rage 2 doesn't have any fucking pacing. The main baddie shoots up my summer camp at the start and then proceeds to sit on his underground cyber toilet rubbing his hands in glee while I go to three old farts who say, oh yeah we totally knew the main baddie would come back and we've got a plan to kill him all set up already and all you need to do is fill out the shopping list. Seven or eight short missions later the plan goes off without a hitch and we utterly chump Mr Big Mouth Scary Trousers because he got inside a giant pile of spam whose unbeatable strategy was to slowly bring its fists down on the spot where I was three seconds ago and then pause for eight or nine minutes to get its breath back. Rage? I've been more enraged by my own trousers but that's uncomfortably large 12 inch knobs for you. The setup of only being able to view the station through mounted cameras that pan slower than an establishing shot of the Parisian skyline in a very boring art film lends an effective sort of Five Nights at Freddy's tension where you might switch to a new camera and discover that all along you were sharing the room with a giant cartoon duck with a switchblade and an erection. And I do recommend it, even if the actual gameplay descends far too often into linear instruction following. I'd have liked a little more time to mess around and freely explore the station's functions. And surely this isn't unreasonable. It's not like the game's set in fucking San Francisco and I'm asking for the freedom to examine every piece of homeless person excrement, it's a fucking five room space station. Just would have been nice to know that at any moment I could have blown the hatches and blasted everyone into space. Not that I would have done that, I'd have regretted it as soon as the orgasm had passed. In contrast to The Last of Us though, Innocence A Tale of Two Plagues is set in 14th century France rather than the post-apocalypse, difficult as it may be to distinguish those two things. I mean Christ, even today going to France is basically exactly the same as sticking your heads in a huge bucket of turds that think they're better than you. But anyway, our protagonist is Amicia de Rune, and with a name like that they were only ever going to be one of two things, medieval French noble woman, or someone who runs a blog talking about their life in the astral realms as a giant humanoid badger who dresses like they're in Final Fantasy IX. I tend to die a lot in an American tale Fievel Goes Plague, despite having the offensive capability of a military grade sniper rifle with racial epithets tipexed along the barrel, Amicia is still a small fragile European and doesn't have much defence, dying instantly from any attack or from accidentally stepping on a square foot of space that a rat whittled on at one point. This was my first time attending an E3 in person, and as I sat down in the audience of the Microsoft presser I realised how much you miss watching these things online, as the camera swept across the rows of hooting paid fan boys in the front rows and very deliberately avoided tracking over the bored looking media types that filled the other two thirds of the room along with the scent of cheap cigarettes. Anyway, the big news is that the new Xbox, Project Scarlet at her, isn't coming out till last quarter 2020, so back to sleep everyone, until the next E3 when they'll really bring the system sellers out and presumably come up with an even worse name for the fucking thing. Funny isn't it how whenever a game talks about being over the top or tongue in cheek that always seems to mean the same thing these days, that it's going to look like an irresponsibly violent version of Jet Set Radio, probably cell shaded, every character is introduced with a freeze frame profile and dresses like a tank girl 
cosplayer with colour blindness and a lot of things will be magenta. Oh yeah, and there'll be a panda for some reason. That was the case with Contra Rogue Corps, which started with a crazy cutscene culminating in our main dude riding a missile into the level, spraying bullets like a giant incontinent doomcock, only for the gameplay to start and everything screeched to a halt as I moved sluggishly around the isometric level, spitting bullets from a gun that overheated faster than a former Trump associate in a police interview room, and took about as long to cool down as an impeachment proceeding. I had one hour to see Wolfenstein Youngblood and Doom Eternal, and after 45 minutes of Wolfenstein's long boring cutscenes, irritating bullet sponge combat and further evidence for the truth of the old saying, crowbar in co-op enhances a previously single player narrative focused experience the way a handful of broken glass enhances cosmetic dentistry, our time was running a bit tight. Oh well I suppose I could switch you to Doom early, Wolfenstein did still have a whole other level to bore you to death with, but if you insist. So I switched to Doom, and Doom proceeded to kick whatever shredded remnants of arse remained unkicked from the last game, so altogether the Bethesda hour was like opening a present that has been wrapped in ten layers of moist bog roll. Doom Eternal was how you fucking do an E3 demo, hands on, quick tutorial, straight into the primary loop to let it speak for itself in the voice of a very handsome man with a thick but somehow reassuring smell clinging to his body hair. Not like all those fucking hands off demos, I still have no fucking clue if Dying Light 2 and Cyberpunk 2077 will still look impressive when being played by someone who isn't following the same rigidly choreographed script they've gone through 30 times today, who might inconveniently look in the wrong direction when something impressive happens or want to operate on an actual fucking learning curve. And as for a Zelda Breath of the Wild sequel, so much for the bold spirit of back to basics innovation that drove the first one, now it's straight back to endlessly stirring the fucking pot for Nintendo, hence Link's Awakening being copy pasted as a fucking Happy Meal toy I suppose. Mind you, direct sequels to Zelda games doing their own thing now the tiresome save princess from Ganon formalities are out of the way, have historically been the breeding ground for some of the really good Zeldas like Link's Awakening or Majora's Mask, so actually a Breath of the Wild sequel could be inter- Alright lock it down, containment bridge! <laughs> The year is 1996. No it isn't yards, it's 20 it was a retrospective device, you fuck! One of those other developers was Monolith, who used the engine to make Blood, released the following year. Now playing the fresh supply version today you'll probably have a jolly good laugh at the pre-rendered cinematics. Haha! <laughs> it looks like the preliminary storyboarding for an episode of Reboot, what were you using for graphics rendering people of the 90s, a fucking bathroom scale. No, trust me, even at the time they looked like absolute shit. Still they bring the story across, Caleb, 19th century gunslinger with a voice like Clint Eastwood if you made a living sucking gravel out of the assholes of bats is trying to cozy up to the dark god Chernobog when Chernobog decides he doesn't quite like the colour of the sweater Caleb knitted for him and promptly murders Caleb and all of his mates. Caleb then basically angries himself back to life, climbs out of the grave with raging morning wood and vows to slaughter all of Chernobog's minions, put all their bits in a breakup box and shove it right up Chernobog's galactic arse. But the real seam of bullshit running through blood like a chocolate brown skirting board is that I don't think the developers realised that the second enemy type in the first level is the hardest one in the game, because they've got hit scan weapons. In the days before anyone could be asked to calculate such trifles as bullet velocity, you just pull the trigger and as long as you have line of sight the thing dies. And when enemies had such weapons, common courtesy dictated that they should at least cough or say, hello I'm about to shoot you before they shoot you, so the player's got time to duck or kill them first. Blood's cultists never got that memo. Step into their line of sight and your vital parts will acquire holes like an argument for alternative medicine under any amount of scrutiny. And these motherfuckers are everywhere. In the higher difficulty settings, which as was usually the case in 90s shooters just meant same dudes were twice as many of the fuckers, one struggles to breathe in an atmosphere of 40% lead. I remember the first time I saw Miriam, Bloodstain's protagonist, my first thought was, are you fucking serious? Why is she wearing one third of a breastplate? The devil horns, the rose tattoos, the puffball miniskirt that's like one millimetre short of putting camel toe on full display, like a frog's head peering over a log, the way she constantly poses like Betty Boop trying to stay upright in a strong wind. She looks like someone opened one of those incredibly pathetic anime girlfriend dress up simulators and then sat on the keyboard. Sometimes the critical path is a bit obscure, I'm ashamed to admit I had to look up the way forward more than once, but rest assured I always made sure to compensate by punching myself in the testicles. Oh, I see, I was supposed to get a water traversal soul from this one random monster that only appears in one room and doesn't even drop it all the time. Oof, couldn't you even figure that out, you stupid swollen testicled fuck? If you want a picture of the future, imagine General Custer's lovingly rendered shiny bellend slapping a human face forever. The Yakuza series is officially over and Kazuma Kiryu has disco stomped his last jawbone into rice pudding, but how could the adventure ever truly be over in Kamarocho, the city whose most famous local dish is the knuckle sandwich, whose streets are covered with so many shards of broken teeth the district is frequently mistaken for a zen garden. It's true though, the main character, Takeyuki Yagami, is not a Yakuza.
Yakuza. He doesn't even wear a disco suit. He wears a leather jacket and the world's least comfortable looking jeans. But I'm pretty sure that the only reason he isn't a Yakuza is because he couldn't fit it in alongside his 16 other jobs. He's a private detective, right, who is also a lawyer, and at various other times works as a bodyguard, a locksmith, and a food critic. That last one because most of the side content revolves around making friends with as many random people around Camarocho as you can, and Camarocho seems to be almost exclusively populated by restaurant employees. Oh yes, and he's also a kung fu master, but that's not really worth mentioning. In Camarocho, if you can't kick with the force of a pneumatic hammer, you officially qualify to use the disabled parking spaces. And as for the Phoenix Wright stuff, it only seems to happen once in the blue moon, and when they do, they don't make me feel clever the way detective bits should. Hmm, which of these pieces of evidence indicates that the victim was felt up by Noel Edmonds in a lift? Yagami asks himself. And there's only three choices. A receipt, a photo of a surprised dog, and a piece of paper saying, I felt up the victim in a lift, signed Noel Edmonds. But will the Sinking City be an improvement on Call of Cthulhu? Well, it's by Frogwares, who since 2002 have been utterly cornering the market on slightly janky Sherlock Holmes adventure games. Remember Creepy Watson? Yeah, that was these lads. So imagine what they can achieve now they're deliberately trying to be creepy. It's nice to see Frogwares finally managing to step outside their comfort zone of developing detective games based on late 19th century literature, and instead develop a detective game based on early 20th century literature. And it only took them 17 fucking years to make the jump. Outstanding. At this rate they'll be adapting modern literature roughly around the time of the heat death of the universe. Now the thing about Lovecraft's particular brand of horror is that it doesn't really translate to modern attitudes, even without the racism stuff. Cosmic horror was all about challenging humanity's self-importance, the horror of Cthulhu lay not in Cthulhu wanting to nibble off our knackers, but in the fact that Cthulhu doesn't really give a shit. He was around before humanity, will be around long after, and spares us no more thought than he would the dust mites in his bathroom carpet. But that horror doesn't work so well in the modern age, when we only need open a web browser to be reminded that humanity is pointless and deserves to die out and leave naught but cheap plastic Spider-Man Halloween costumes for the archaeologists of future races to puzzle over. So Lovecraftian horror requires a different approach to be effective these days, and whatever the ideal approach is, it isn't whatever the fuck Sinking City is doing. The stories are nicely worked out, I like the way we physically combine facts to draw conclusions in the memory palace, grand a title as that might be for a boxy menu screen. I could make a fucking text window in Microsoft Access and call it Alibaba's Cave of Wonders, but I'd only be fooling myself. All the stuff that makes a game memorable, context, story moments, they're all lost in this dreary attempt at effortless humour that reminds me unpleasantly of Sunset Overdrive, except where that felt like the result of a room full of 35 year olds endlessly workshopping what the kids find amusing these days, my friend Pedro feels like it reaches the same place just by being too lazy to put much thought into it. It even does the same thing where one of the enemy factions is nerdy gamers, not cool gamers like what you, the player, presumably are, and it still comes across as obnoxiously aloof. It also does the thing where it goes, oh look a sewer level, how original, roll eyes, and then proceeds to unironically have a sewer level that goes on way too fucking long. If you know it's bad, why are you doing it? Surely the comedic subversive thing to do would be to pretend we're having a sewer level and then go, oh bollocks to this hackneyed shit, let's have a level where you ride an ostrich through a bouncy castle. That's about it, so let's move on to our next game, Sea of Solitude, an EA original, part of EA's plan to redeem themselves in the eyes of the world, occasionally withdraw their fist from the butthole of their terrified employees, and pat an indie developer on the head with a hand still slick with anxious liquid shit. Look, there's a thing, it represents thing, isn't that clever? The game would benefit enormously from an edit, if not total removal of all spoken dialogue, and I'm not just saying that because of the voice acting. The game officially lost me the first time I heard a monster speak in the voice of a normal person putting on a stupid monster voice. Rawr, okay, you never do anything right. I'm one of your inner demons, have we made that obvious enough yet? Rawr. I noted in the credits that Kay's voice actor was also the lead animator for the project, how relieving it was to hear she hadn't given up the day job. Oh no, I didn't give my depressed boyfriend enough space. Verily must I be clothed in the raiments of the traitor, and banish myself to the wine-dark seas of nothingness to dwell forevermore. Just stop texting him so much, you dippy moo! And I wouldn't be so harsh, but I don't even have a decent game to frame it around. Don't code that swimming in the sea where the monster lurks is bad and dangerous if swimming in the sea is the next thing we have to do to progress, for fuck's sake. Unless this is another metaphor. Ooh, the darkness that shrouds the way forward represents the darkness that Kay saw after her head disappeared up her own ass. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. So far, the Zero Punctuation Occasional Guide to R-Word Moments in G-Word H-Word has covered publishers with bad ideas, developers with bad hairdos, exclusivity deals, graphical quantum leaps, and moral panics. But how could I have overlooked the one aspect of the games industry that is the most prodigious seam of r wordation of them all? Marketing. Maybe it's because the industry is still relatively young, but the shittiness of misguided video game marketing is a particularly rich shade of creamy brown. Whether it be John Romero proudly informing the magazine reading public that he was going to make them all into institutional rape victims, or Sony parading a dead goat around at the God of War 3 launch party. No, really, they did that. It started in 2002, when in the run-up to the release of horror-themed action-adventure Shadow Man 2, Acclaim announced that they would pay the funeral costs of anyone willing to put a Shadow Man 2 advert on the headstone of a deceased relative, prompting public outcry and the Church of England basically telling them to piss off. Yes, Church of Tea and Crumpets with the Vicar England. Takes a lot to upset those lads, they don't even hate gays that much. Later the same year, Acclaim promoted the resoundingly mediocre Turok evolution by offering a sack of cash to anyone who was willing to christen their newborn baby Turok, apparently shifting their demographic focus to the other end of the scale. Now, 
one might reasonably say at this point, surely it wasn't a serious offer to let new parents cash in on their future bullying victims, surely these were just shock tactics to grab headlines, the way a graffiti artist just wants attention and doesn't literally want to fuck the police. I mean, be serious, there aren't enough hours in the day. Well, the claim would always insist these were genuine offers when pressed, and therefore they must have been by the universal law of no take backsies. But they also claimed that the baby name idea was taken from a marketing expert named Simeon Cantrell, who it turned out didn't exist, who wrote a book whose ISBN number in truth belonged to a book of children's knock knock jokes. A room full of executives passed around the nitrous oxide and reached the conclusion that the next logical step for the popular Dave Mirror freestyle BMX series was to have a version of the game where everyone had their tits and bums hanging out. It was a staggeringly cheap and awful concept, and upon getting wind of it, Dave Mirror paused briefly between one handers to firmly request that his name be taken off. A claim then went, Well, he said that, but maybe if we kept him in the game anyway, he'd realise that we just want to include him in our good natured knockabout fun fest and come around to our mission to delight the tit and bum loving children of the world. And you know what? Dave Mirror's heart grew three sizes that day. Nah, I'm just kidding, he sued their bollocks off. We, people who like single-player narrative-based video games, really are the fucking disgruntled older siblings of this industry, aren't we? Nothing is ours forever. Alright, you've had enough fun with your new Wolfenstein series, give it up now so we can let your hyperactive little cunt of a younger brother have it. Oh, he doesn't like it so much, so we're gonna break its kneecaps and make it multiplayer-focused. You were done with it, right? Why can't we just have something that's ours? Why does everything we have eventually get handed to Timmy cunt face? You know he fucks the dog, right? Well, maybe if you bought a loot box now and then, we'd overlook you molesting the pets too. Now, regular viewers will know I already hold a grudge against this game after E3, when I had to play it for three quarters of my hour with Bethesda and it would have gone on longer if I hadn't insisted on switching to Doom, but it turns out I was wise to do that because if I hadn't I'd have ended up playing 90% of the fucking plot right there. There's a live system that you and the old ball and chain have to share. Run out and you have to start the mission all over again. Oh, did you originally go into the mission with three lives? Well now you have to restart it with one, fuck you. But why Wolfenstein Youngblood? Because we hate you, player. We hate that you exist. Because by existing you prove that there's an audience for this tosh, forcing us to make it when none of us give much of a shit about it and would much rather be, say, working on the new Doom or picking biscuit crumbs out of our belly hair. So in conclusion, Wolfenstein Youngblood gives so little shit it is actively removing shit from the universe. Put that on your blurb, Bethesda, the video game equivalent of a colonic irrigation. My attention was drawn to a new indie game and shortly after I started playing I was hooked by its unique charm and the staggering amount of effort that must have gone into it. I couldn't understand why the game didn't have more exposure. Yes, it was swimming in the eternal ocean-sized grease trap that is the Steam indie game market, but the really interesting new titles usually find a way to break surface. Maybe I could be the one to bring it the exposure it deserves and then all the little indie game developing pixies will carry me shoulder high and finally acknowledge me as their god. That was day one. After two weeks I still hadn't finished the game and had realised that I completely didn't want to play any more of the bloody thing, which if all you future game critics are taking notes is what we professionals call a con. So the game we're talking about is Horus, just in case you got to this video by randomly clicking the screen or some other method that precludes reading the fucking title, and of all the games on Steam that carry the user tag Story Rich, Horus is one of the few that deserves it. It's riding a fucking story limo down Story Street, braying with laughter and flicking crumpled dollar bills to the story crack whores. No 2D pixel art game should be a 14 gig download for fuck's sake. Throwing more stuff into baby's trough was clearly more important than testing or refining what was in there, keeping the apple sauce separate from the bacon grease. Perhaps they gotta fix some of the bugs, like the one that made me stop playing. At the point when the game gets bored again and decides it's going to be a metroidvania for a bit, which made the platforming even more demoralising because now I didn't know if it was even taking me the right fucking way, I accidentally glitched through a puzzle I didn't have the means to solve and soft logged my whole fucking run. And I was sad, viewer, because I still think Horace is worth a chance. In contrast to AAA games, there's clearly actual love in it, but there's such a thing as too much love, as my ex once told me as I wanked off into the tribal. Back before Mass Effect finished itself off with all the grace and elegance of the last season of Game of Thrones wanking into a bin, whenever I played one of those games it always struck me how you only ever saw that universe from the top of the social heap, from the perspective of a universally famous and respected galactic saviour who can swan about on the best ship ever, decking journalists with impunity and being extremely flighty about what his favourite store in the Citadel is. I always wondered what the Mass Effect universe was like to the average fuck, just about qualified to reverse their space van out of their own space driveway and deliver crates of flavourless nutrient paste to the worker cubes. How did they feel about Commander Shepard? Were they happy with the flavour of ice cream they got at the end of Mass Effect 3? Well, I guess we'll never know now, since after Mass Effect Andromeda, more Mass Effect is about as hotly demanded as the Jeffrey Epstein bumper fun activity book for kids, but don't pout because Rebel Galaxy Outlaw is here, a game in the tradition of Wing Commander Privateer about being an average fuck flying a great big skip around the sci-fi future with only two major concerns, one staying alive and two not being dead. Rebel Galaxy Outlaw is set in a sci-fi universe with a frontier western vibe to it which I preferred when it was called Borderlands, which I preferred when it was called Firefly, which I preferred when it was called Cowboy Bebop, delete according to generation. Control entirely takes place within the headquarters of the Federal Bureau of Control, a mysterious inscrutable government agency tasked with the securing, containing and, you guessed it, protection of mundane objects that have acquired mysterious inscrutable properties. Like a bread bin that inscrutably turns sourdough into multigrain, or a Netflix true crime documentary that mysteriously isn't massively over-sensationalised. Jessie's a strange character, she comes across as rather emotionally guarded, perhaps understandable since she originally came here to start a prison riot or something, so to make her motivations clear the game has her narrate her inmost thoughts in voiceover, often just before 
course you talk to someone, which can sometimes come across like we've turned on subtitles for the attention deficit. I should talk to this person about my missing brother. Hey, did I mention that my brother went missing? But what throws me is that she never seems particularly troubled or challenged by anything that goes on. She literally acquires the ability to fly at one point and just shruggingly files it alongside her other superpowers, like a quarterly bank statement. In this way she reflects her environment, I suppose, this clean mundane corporate office building that harbours mysterious inscrutable secrets and the occasional superpowered monster fight, but it does make it hard to relate to her. Personally I'd react a bit more strongly to suddenly being able to fly. I'd be all like, fucking sweet, the squirrels in my garden have imposed upon their last bird feeder. But the format demands that the story end on a weak source, now finish all the side quests, note, so I'm not prepared to say the story ends at all on any satisfying level. In summary then, Control is intriguing enough with its mysterious inscrutable stuff, but the combat is cloying and about as annoying as a limerick that doesn't end properly. Now I'm not in favour of putting labels on everything per se, unless I'm looking for my lunch in a workplace fridge, but on the other hand I do support putting bells around the necks of people with incurable infectious diseases, and that's how I think of a lot of my work. There are a couple of particularly loud and clangy bells dangling from this week's subject, which is fitting because all of its characters are bellends. The game makes a big thing of its movie night mode, where up to five people on a couch can enjoy the story together. You know, the kind of thing you do when you suspect it's going to be really bad and want someone to take the piss out of it with. Turns out the movie night mode is just the single player, but every now and again a message pops up saying pass the controller to such and such, and I'm pretty sure I could have created this mode myself with literally any single player game, or indeed any DVD with pause and skip functions. Man of Medan is about five really quite spectacularly awful people who go on a diving holiday in the South Pacific, only to get drawn into a sort of extremely gritty episode of Scooby-Doo, involving pirates and an abandoned ghost ship about 35-40% to 40 as horrible as they deserve. And the only reason I can't summarise each personality in one word, like I could with Until Dawn, is because I have to stick the word annoying on the front of them all. Annoying jock. Annoying nerd. Annoying rich girl. Annoying sex pest. Oh Yahtzee, you talk like you've never watched a Jason film, and cheered as a complex sentient being, established in two minutes of screen time to have some abrasive qualities, gets his scrotum bisected with a lawn edger. It's a horror story, you're supposed to hate the cast so you can enjoy their comeuppance. Two problems with that. First, they don't decide to go to the ghost ship, the pirates take them there, so it's not exactly poetic justice, and second, on my first run through all of them survived, so apparently it's not hard to do so. Although I am unusually good at quick time events. I learned how to react quickly in my time as chief skirting board cleaner at the hospital for compulsive buggerers. Also, having a plot branch depend on something like whether or not we examine the giant golden clitoris in the sex museum, when interacting with it is the only thing you can do in the sex museum, and approximately 99% of players will do so, and the remaining 1% only didn't because they were killed by a rogue sniper, that's the sort of thing that gets annoying when you're on the achievement hunt looking for all the paths. One thing I find worth mentioning is that when annoying sex pest sex pesters annoying judgmental captain lady, in one version of events she rightly shuts him the fuck down and later on he might get his knackers minced in the workings of a grandfather clock, but there's an equally valid timeline where she is successfully romanced by his horrible attitude, and he rides off into the sunset arm in arm with his future acrimonious divorce. Remnant? You know, I'm torn on doing a dry heave here. I always dry heave when a new game tries to have a colon to double title for the sake of the dream of larger franchising that odds are good will remain naught but a glint in the publisher's eye, but if you took the colon out of Remnant <laughs> from the ashes, it would work perfectly well as a single title. Remnant from the ashes. Sure, a remnant is a logical thing to find in some ashes. If you're finding, say, bread bins or lollipop ladies in the ashes, that might be a cause for concern or a sign you need to buy a hotter oven, but remnants? Sure, ashes are loaded with the fuckers. But here comes the second act twist, listeners. Remnant is doing something right, because after a while I was getting into it. That's why I'm annoyed I can't remember how the plot started. See, I fell into a trance early on, going through ruined sewer after ruined sewer in a boring Darksiders-esque apocalyptic city, but I awoke from my trance several hours later to find myself going through a bunch of stargates following some kind of interdimensional Dr. Livingston on safari through a multiverse of radioactive desert worlds and jungle planets where enigmatic creatures offered alliances and less enigmatic but considerably more numerous creatures offered a variety of primitive bladed weapons up the rusty periscope, and I'd kind of like to remember how the fuck I got there. Throughout history, gamers and gaming correspondents have always divided games into the world worthies and the unworthies, and this dichotomy has taken many forms. PC versus consoles, hardcore versus casual, mobile versus everything else, but for me the split has always been thus. Games that make you feel versus games that make you numb. Some games challenge and energise your emotions and give you ideas and inspiration, whereas other games seek only to massage your rodent brain with repetitive pats to the head so you don't think dangerous thoughts, like I wish my landlord wouldn't keep coming into my house and eating all my family's pies. It's often the case that truly great horror plays upon primal universal anxieties, often the sort of things our parents warned us about as children, and Blair Witch is a prime example. Now listen here, little Yati, my father used to say to me, before you go out tonight, remember, never, ever expect much from any horror franchise that's more than 15 years old and only ever really had one decent film in it. But daddy, I quite liked Freddy vs. Jason. Ah, but son, you mustn't forget that while the crossover was certainly gratifying, it's difficult for modern viewers to get past the dated CG gore effects. Now run along and play, and if those rowdy boys next door dare you to go into the haunted forest again, remember, nobody likes a pussy. But complications arise because it turns out he's a war veteran with PTSD, and the Blair Witch apparently wants to get some use out of the correspondence course she took with Silent Hill and turn his 
own inner demons against him. To help him along, Jerome K. Normal Bloke is a sort of therapy support dog thingy following him around named Bullet. Now, I'm no psychologist, but if you're training up a therapy dog specifically for helping a traumatised war veteran who tends to have PTSD flashbacks when reminded of violence, naming him Bullet seems a bit counterproductive to me. It's either very misguided or the work of a very devious therapist trying to ensure a guaranteed source of income. What's your dog's name? Bullet. Did you say Bullet? What? Where? Where? Anyway, after a lot of stumbling around, we make the discoveries that progress the plot, and soon enough, night falls and we have to get our spooky flashlight out, so I turned it on and said, No, seriously now, Blooper Team, where's my real flashlight? You're not trying to tell me that Jimmy Wingnut here ventured into the forest with nothing but the light up eyes on an old Thundercats toy, but I think what really kills my recommendation is the ending. I got a bad ending, this not being the sort of game that ends with a pizza party and the Wizard of Oz finally granting the main character a personality, but then I discovered that there was also a good ending, so I looked up what you need to do to get the good ending, and apparently it involves not killing the monsters with your flashlight. Oh sorry, kind of thought I should defend myself against the flickering screeching thing that kept running up in the dark and kicking me in the balls as scary music played, but apparently I was supposed to be the bigger man. Get the bogeyman around the negotiating table, see if he'll compromise and just bite off the kidnapped child's legs. Obviously we expect you to defend yourself, Yards, you're supposed to get the bad ending on your first run, it's for replay value. Oh well in that case, up yours Blair Witch, I'd rather replay my last prostate exam. Well I have successfully navigated Gears of War 5 story campaign, the way a Taco Bell family platter navigates its way out of a desperately clenched sphinx and now I have to give my impressions by spontaneously dropping dead like a coal mine canary. Gears 5, despite being a traditionally Xbox exclusive franchise, came out on both Xbox and Steam, which I found suspiciously convenient. What are you up to, Microsoft and Valve? Is this a sign of battle lines being drawn for the upcoming subscription service Civil War? Or have the two of you realised you had more in common than you thought? Wow, I thought I was the only one who liked squatting over the balcony and disgorging torrents of warm diarrhoea onto the peasants below, and then wiping my asshole with fistfuls of blood-stained money. What's different this time is that the plot mainly centres around one of those willowy ladies, the franchise keeps around to juxtapose against the way every single male character is built like a Quake 1 ogre cosplaying as an electric stove. We need to go over there, and by over there I mean towards that big scary building full of enemies. Oh great, so what's the good news? Well the good news is that I'm very handsome and glib and SHUT THE FUCK UP! There's one set piece early in Gears Gyve that's an extended reference to the musical Hamilton of all things, when you find yourself on stage at a theatre with a monstrosity, spotlights come on and jazzy music plays as you fight it, and as is often the case when a game starts singing at you this could have been quite a highlight, like the ashtray maze in Control, or that number the Joker does in Arkham Knight, or the wonderful musical sound that Wolfenstein Youngblood makes when you smash it with a hockey stick. Something seems to have happened to Platinum Games around the time it was making Near Automata. These were the lads who brought us Bayonetta and Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, in which a bespectacled muscular senator power bombs the hero while lecturing him about his favourite neoconservative policies with a relish that stops just short of bursting into song. But Near Automata was somewhat muted, tonally, at least as far as any game with such lovingly rendered buttocks can be, and I see a lot of its influence on Astral Chain, especially the music. I was mentally back in Near Automata every time I went to the Astral realm and heard the sound of distant choral voices singing a song inspired by a dial-up modem. <coughs> Attention all officers, a giant armoured gorilla is flinging exploding turds around city centre. <coughs> you mean a 2218? <coughs> no, it's a 2219 because he's wearing a sombrero. Ah, nothing quite like an unambiguously shit game to brighten a critic's week. It's like standing under an elephant on a hot summer day and taking a long relaxing stream of piss to the face. Konami are fucking unstoppable. Every single thing people used to like them for, all lined up by the shallow grave one by one and popped off with a systematic coldness that would trouble Heinrich Himmler. Castlevania, pow, God of War ripoff. Metal Gear Solid, pow, zombie survival. Silent Hill, pow, homecoming, pow, shattered memories, pow, downpour, pow, cancel Silent Hills. I think it's dead now, Konami. Are you sure? That bit just twitched. Pow, pachinko machine. And now it's Contra's turn. What have you got in store for this one, Uber Sturm Führer Konami, you fucking monster? Why a diablo -y, gauntlet esque looter shooter, of course, although I also get a bit of a Smash TV vibe because after playing it for six hours that's precisely what I wanted to do. We play as one of four crazy mercenaries. There's standard Contra dude with standard allergy to shirts and gun the size of an industrial lathe, and then there's three other twats that you'll try out once each and then go back to the standard Contra McRib that walks like a man because at least A I understand how his special power works, and B it isn't fucking useless, and C he doesn't seem to be trying so hard to be quirky and interesting that his dealy boppers are about to explode with the effort. The other three are an alien with a posh accent who throws a sort of black hole grenade with the suction power of a handheld vacuum whose filter hasn't been cleaned since the 70s, there's a giant vicious panda, pandas being the fucking spirit animal of the quirky magenta game, who has the power to drop stationary turrets that can't rotate and which as such the enemy can outwit by moving slightly to the left, and there's the token hot lady who's a gender swapped version of Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with a katana buried in her stomach orifice, where do you fucking start with this one, and who ostensibly gains power when she pulls the sword out. Not sure how though. As far as I could 
could tell it mainly just makes her faster. Which admittedly is a pretty special power in this fucking game where by default every character moves like someone filled their shoes with depleted uranium Lego. At first I thought the game just flat out didn't have any plot after the intro cartoon, like that was the lure to get us into the tedious grind, the glowy light on the front of a deep sea anglerfish, the advert for a retirement home that shows old people smiling. But no, the plot does continue. There's a new cartoon after every chapter. The game just doesn't fucking show you them. You have to go to the profile menu to watch them from the video archive. And why would I ever go to the profile menu? What's likely to be on there? My current level, number of hours played, that would only depress me. There's no rational reason not to just automatically show the cartoon after you beat the chapter. It's got to be daughter seduction. So was there anything you liked about Contra Rogue Core Yahtzee? Man, even the fucking title sounds like a grandparent falling down a staircase. Well, I did kind of like how on the menu, instead of saying quit the game, it says terminate the game. That language is a lot more in line with my feelings after I've played Contra Rogue Core for any length of time. Yes, please terminate this fucking tosh. Please murder it. If only there was an option for ejecting it from my hard drive with a fucking clay pigeon launcher. Isn't it a shame in today's economy that the average age of retirement keeps getting later and later? Poor old Tom Clancy's been dead for six years and he still has to show up for work. Surely it's eventually got to occur to one of those duplicated Sorcerer's Apprentice broomsticks at Ubisoft that putting the name of a literal corpse on a game implying that the game was solely authored and directed by an immobile mindless stinking corpse might not be the greatest sales pitch. Although I'll grant you I can't fault it for honest advertising. After having played A Stinking Corpse's Ghost Recon Breakpoint, I'd realised that it is officially the game in which the A Stinking Corpse Ubisoft sandbox finally dropped all pretense. Enemy bases and strongholds dot the map like genital wards, each one a thoughtless sprawl of buildings sprinkled with generic baddies you are under no obligation to clear out, so most of the time I just make a beeline for the objective and hide under a desk until my any alerted enemies got bored and went back to counting their eyeballs. Sometimes it wasn't quite that easy though when a whole pack of the bastards would corner me so I'd have to wait just inside a doorway for the enemy to go through their usual battle strategy. Enter door in single file, wade through increasingly large sea of bodies, get shot in face. So first we buy your game Ubisoft and then you charge us more money to not have to play it. If I paid double price up front would you just not give it to me at all? Take a step back people because this has all gotten way too fucking normalised. When you charge money for something you can produce infinitely at zero cost, like in-game currency, that's not a service. That is the fucking death of economics as a concept. How the fuck did we get here from basic principles of trade? It's like walking up to a dude in the stocks in the village square and saying if you give me three turnips I'll spit in your face. So I played Indivisible this week which isn't a shooter although it might be every other bloody genre. Get this, it's a metroidvania platformer with a twist on JRPG style active time battling that plays a bit like a fighting game which might sound like a breakfast scramble made of eggs, twiglets and pushpins but I have to say it works. Or rather it worked for a while. Tease of eventual opinion deployed, execute backtrack, initiate waffle. The problem is there's a moment in the game and it's remarkable how finely I can pinpoint it where an invisible lever gets thrown and the bottom drops out and it stops being fun. It's about the point when you meet the pirate lesbian and the world opens up and you know we're in trouble when a pirate lesbian marks anything but an upturn in events. The problem is in the numbers. I don't know if they were originally making another fighting game and just got bored but that might explain the ridiculous number of party members you get. This is some chrono cross level shit. The primest real estate in the world is a teenage girl's noggin apparently and Arjun is beating the tenants off with a stick. But it's the story that really ices my sticky underfolds. There's something unpleasantly freedom planety about Arjun the spunky wonder teen around whom the whole world revolves. Every party member she meets blurts out their entire backstory and motivation like they're on a fucking speed date but is then content to put their entire life and character development on hold so they can hang around Arjuna's brain passing the blunt around and help out with whatever she wants to do. It's writing on a level slightly below bottom tier anime and slightly above first time webcomic. So in summary Indivisible, here's a trophy for the animation and a trophy for the bold spirit of core gameplay innovation and now for everything else here's 16 punches to the throat. Fallout's characteristic Vats aim assist is replaced rather middleman cutting outingly with a basic slow motion power that the plot can barely summon the effort to explain. It's a side effect of, I don't know, being chronically frozen next to the rocket ship ice lollies. And while you can specialise in melee rather than ranged combat, the slow motion ability is a hell of a lot more useful for a gun user. You're almost always fighting multiple targets so I could just hit slow-mo, pop them all once in the eyeballs and then dive back into cover while they're readjusting their contact lenses. Aside from that, the Obsidian brand depth of player choice is here. You can even side with the corporations if you want, but they are both evil and failing horribly so it's like betting on the Nazis to win World War II even as Magda Goebbels is biting down on her suicide pill. Eventually it turns out that the system is unsustainable and the corporations are going to bureaucracy the whole colony to death, but what the fuck am I supposed to do? I'm a freelance adventurer. Come back when there's a threat that I can have a sword fight with. Essentially, the game has to pull a big villain out of its ass in the last hour or so for the sake of a final boss fight. Maybe it was a mistake to try to gel the dashing space captain thing with the on the nose societal commentary thing. Flash Gordon crash lands on an alien planet because he got shot down by villains, not because the insurance company kept contesting his maintenance costs. It was nice to see Call of Duty making the important first step of realising it had a problem. I mean, I could and indeed did point this out around the time they were hiring Kit Harrington to play a space terrorist from Mars. No offence Kit Harrington, I'm sure you're a perfectly decent fellow, it's just that your presence often seems to be an omen of ill fortune. You're like a banshee but with mouth breathing instead of shrieking. No but really we're updating modern warfare to more reflect the shape of international conflict today rather than how it was in 2007. Oh okay, so the plot will mainly be about burly professional American soldiers getting pulled out of the Middle East because a dictator rang up the president and the president
president didn't want to look lame in front of the cool kids. No, of course it bloody won't. It'll be Middle Eastern terrorists and evil Russians, again. Except with a new mealy-mouthed Ubisoft-esque version of taking political stances, so characters will occasionally look to camera and go, boy it's a shame how all these unflinchingly Saturday morning cartoon villainous Russians are reflecting badly on all those nice non-skeletor-like Russians, none of whom we are showing you but do assuredly exist. As for the gameplay, pick up the gun and shooty shooty, constant chaos, spunk goggle wee wee, ooh why won't those meddling politicians let us murder foreigners as we see fit, wanky wanky, spy on your neighbours, patriot act, racism… have they gone yet? Have the Call of Duty fans heard enough and fucked off to buy it in droves yet? Right, serious question for the rest of you. Why are you here? I'm sick of talking about it. But now that you are here, expecting your Modern Warfare review, let's talk about Disco Elysium instead. That's right, stealth indie review! You just got lured into a shadow by a thrown object and contextual button neck snapped, motherfucker. So in brief, it's Planescape Torment meets Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And when I say skill checks, I don't mean rolling for strength or lockpicking. Where the fuck do you think you are, Gimli son of Gloin? Instead, you put points into rhetoric, conceptualization, savoir fair and various other aspects of personality, all of which have their own distinct voice in your head, ensuring that the main character has as much dialogue with himself as he does with other characters, and two times shitloads is a lot of shitloads, buddy! Yes, I should stress that if you're scared off by too much reading then you'd better move along and get back to shooting scary foreigners, because Disco Elysium is wordier than an Ayn Rand monologue in a dumpster full of refrigerator poetry kits. Disco Elysium is a bona fide work of art that elevates the medium of video games. No, it's not for everyone, but making games as broad as possible has long been the major part of the fucking problem. The reason why following mainstream releases is like watching a sausage making machine filling condoms with glue. Speaking of which, better get back on topic in case any Call of Duty fans decided to skip to the end. Ooh, pick up that grenade, ratatat ratatat, strawberry jam on the glasses, Bay of Pigs, Iran Contra, 70% on Metacritic, etc, etc, stick it up your fucking bum, Activision. The first Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube was about a mansion over which Luigi could reasonably claim ownership. Luigi's Mansion, perfect title. Luigi's Mansion 2 was still about mansions, they weren't strictly Luigi's, but he at least had more claim to them than Tom Clancy had over the last Ghost Recon game. But now in Luigi's Mansion 3, Luigi doesn't own it, and it's not even a fucking mansion. It's a high hotel. A mansion is a resident, no one permanently resides in a luxury hotel, except Russian oligarchs and former child stars with no financial savvy. Be careful Nintendo, little white lies mount up and you start believing your own bullshit, saying things like there are people who want to play Overwatch on the Switch. See, the goal of each floor is to find the elevator button for the next floor, and more often than not Luigi finds it, then gets spooked by the boss of the floor and drops it again. If only he had some kind of high-powered suction device close to hand to avoid situations like this, but whatever, you have to introduce the boss somehow. But then on one level, I suck off the boss, get the button back to the elevator, and a fucking cat steals it, and I'm obliged to backtrack through the level and the previous one looking for where the cat hid, so it can run off and hide somewhere else. This continues until the game's invisible let's fuck the player about meter is filled and the cat arbitrarily fights you instead of hiding again. What was that, Yahtzee? I said this whole cat business feels like arbitrarily fucking the player about to pad out the runtime, Nintendo. Well, we can't have that. I know, let's have it happen a second time, changing nothing. That way it will be recurringly fucking the player about. I was watching a digital Norman Reedus piss into a toilet, and when the toilet presented me a new piss grenade to throw at ghosts during my next hiking trip, I thought the piss looked a bit dark and orange which in reality would be a sign of dehydration. I wondered if the game darkens Norman Reedus' piss if he doesn't hydrate often enough. I then further wondered if there was any game developer on this planet who could leave me genuinely uncertain as to whether or not their game has a year in coloration algorithm besides Hideo Kojima. Perhaps that alone is what makes him worth celebrating, even if his new game is more weird and boring than getting cornered by a caffeinated anime fan who wants to talk about his crossover fanfic between Attack on Titan and Last of the Summer Wine. It's odd when a game that's mostly been based around encouraging players to find their own way to transport a corpse across two square miles of the surface of Mars suddenly won't let you press on until you've shown you can fling a blood grenade at an octopus 19 times. Or shoot Mads Mikkelsen. These aren't the skills you've been training me in, Hideo Kojima. I'm a hiker postman. My skills are delivering stuff and complaining that my ladder's too short. That mission in the mountains where I had an hour's time limit to fetch medical supplies felt more like a boss fight that would fit this gameplay core, but by then I'd unlocked the ability to build zip lines, which are fucking broken, frankly. Turned an hour's trudge through hostile mountainous terrain into a five minute Disneyland ride. Sure, any game that tries to balance combat, stealth, hiking, package transport and urine is going to be a controller mapping nightmare, but there had to be a more efficient way to calm down a jar full of baby than four different button presses plus waving the controller around like you're inventing a new sign language word for disinterested hand job. For once AAA is using its powers for good, by powers I mean enormous wealth, but hey it's never made a difference to Batman, they made a good old fashioned single player action adventure cobbled together from good ideas cribbed from other single player action adventures that people seem to like, and the result is a perfectly solid if somewhat unoriginal game that people seem to like that they barely even tried to wring out for maximum cash. Although I'm sure the only reason EA were willing to take the risk is because it's 
Star Wars. It could never have turned a profit otherwise, since publishers continue to insist it's standard practice that AAA games be developed on solid gold desks, with computers liquid-cooled by the semen of prize-winning stallions. Cal, who seems to have a problem with his jaw that makes it constantly jut forwards like he's trying to bite his own nose off, bears a number of suspicious parallels with other Star Wars protagonists. Humble starting point, secret force powers, has a robot pal who talks like Stephen Hawking learning to whistle. But Luke Skywalker was always a direct copy-paste of the standard heroic monomyth, so when I imply that Cal is cribbing him off, what I mean is that all the characters and story arcs in this game are tired and obvious tropes. The haunted mentor, the roguish captain with a heart of gold. We've even got our very own custom Darth Vader, a Lady Vader no less, Darth Lader, who has the very own identity reveal twist that for the record I called about two hours beforehand. Nothing wrong with falling back on hero with a thousand faces as long as we have some decent sword fights, Yahtzee, if you say so, but sometimes it feels like fallen hors d'oeuvre is trying to hit the checkpoints on the story arcs without putting in the legwork, if you see what I mean. Like when our mentor sits us down mid-fast travel for some character building and goes, I know you don't trust me anymore, and I'm like, I don't? News to me. I've just been going up and down zip lines for the last two hours. And then there's the bit on the fourth planet where we're literally outside the boss fight and the game slams the door in our face and says, where do you think you're going? You have to be at your lowest emotional point before the final act. Kapow, you are now sad. Go to this whole other fucking planet for a vision quest and don't come back till you've had an epiphany, asshole. Shenmue is a franchise beginning on the Sega Dreamcast with a cult following that I am fairly certain exists as an elaborate decade-spanning practical joke. And after this review, if you choose to buy Shenmue 3, I will group you alongside someone who continues to try to sniff a clown's lapel flower after the third squirt of water to the face. Come on now, guys. I mean, this used to be funny, back when we were all pretending that Shenmue was a pioneering classic of interactive narrative and that we were all totally disappointed that it didn't get a third installment back in the day, but now the joke's getting cruel. I know the modern world has been almost totally infected by the fog of irony that the internet generates the way a Renaissance-era European port city generates the Black Death, but let's at least try to put that aside. Straight talk only, okay? Shenmue is and always was a terrible, terrible game, and I refuse to accept that any of you seriously believe otherwise. And if I sound particularly mad about it, it's because I literally just got too angry to keep playing and I'm making sure to write this down now before I encounter a small animal and have to use up all this useful energy kicking it to death. I wonder if the Shenmue fanbase only exists because of its close ties to the Dreamcast. Like all less than successful retro consoles, there will always be a base of dedicated fans complaining to this day that it would have been so much more competitive if only it had had the games. Yes, probably, and I could have been an Olympic sprinter if only my legs weren't tiny malformed stumps jutting from my pelvis like the last pair of wings in the KFC bargain bucket. Hello, Mr. Hazuki. Hello. Do you know where to find inexpensive prostitutes? Hmm. I think you can find some at- All right, he took the money! Go, go, go! Let me talk you through the process that led to me descending the slopes of Mount Rage Quid. After considerable bumbling, the plot led eventually to the inevitable gang of local scoundrels, which meant I was going to have to deal with the fucking combat. And the combat in Shenmue is like a wasp locked in your bathroom. You can get through most of the day without having to worry about it, but you're gonna have to face it eventually if you ever hope to defecate with peace of mind. And like a wasp, it's best dealt with by flailing madly at the controls. So I get to a plot mandatory fight with the gang leader, and naturally he hydrates his lawn with Ryo Hazuki's tear ducts, because Shenmue 3 up to this point have mostly been picking flowers and humouring old people. But not to worry, because one of the old people I can humour has a secret martial arts technique they will teach me if I beat up all the monks in the local dojo and bring him expensive presents. And there is nothing in Shenmue that cannot be achieved as long as you're willing to grind horrible mini-games. Beating up all the monks wasn't too hard. After I spent several days grinding up my defence and attack stats by repeatedly punching a tree, practising each combo a hundred times, and having Ryo stand like he's about to do squats and then mash a button to make him very emphatically not do squats, making money was the real pain in the ass. I thought I'd figured it out. Go to the fortune teller, ask which turtle's gonna win the turtle race and bet the farm on it, although you still have to mash like a bastard to sing songs of encouragement. Trust me, it sounds a lot more interesting than it is. This worked three times in a row, but then on the fourth, I mashed hard enough to spark a very awkward conversation with my orthopaedic specialist and lost everything. Fuck me, at least Leisure Suit Larry gave you a quick save. Ended up having to grind up the money chopping wood, which pays worse than giving hand jobs to church mice, but finally I did it. I ground up enough time in annoying minigames to learn the secret technique, and then I marched confidently up to the gang leader who'd been courteous enough not to move, and he proceeded to hydrate his lawn with Ryo Hazuki's tear ducts again. And that's where I said, fuck it. Is it fair to diss Bug Fables for not being exactly like Paper Mario? Yes, because that's literally what it was setting out to do, but it is better than the fucking void that is the actual Paper Mario franchise these days, so if someone says to you, sorry you can't fuck pigs anymore, try this pencil case full of bacon, it's up to you if you're going to get offended or start looking into the best ways to launder grease out of your underpants. Oh, we love our fucking memes, don't we? Can't just enjoy a charming little game about a rascally goose getting up to Beano Comics level mischief. No, we haven't enjoyed it properly until we put it next to a picture of an angry cat and confused our grandparents with it on social media. It remains impossible to predict what does and does not have meme appeal. It's an amusing enough little game, but I have now established my satisfaction what it looks like when the old man falls on his bum, and frankly I see no need to revisit it. Not exactly a cultural touchstone. Not yet, anyway. Maybe one more photoshop of a goose standing next to Hitler will make all the difference. After Sniper Ghost Warrior 3 was an embarrassing dribble in the great pissing contest of life, the solution for fixing it was apparently to nick some ideas from the Hitman series, including a lot of the visual design and one of the subtitles. So the foot is off the story pedal, and now it's just here's an enclosed map, here's the 
person whose face needs a new nostril, away you go. And it is an improvement, but lacking quick saves, it suffers all the more from Hitman's problem with Cock Up Cascade. I lost interest in this one because after I spent 20 minutes sniping my way through a field of baddies, I stepped out thinking it was finally safe, and the game went, Look out! Enemy sniper! Where? Behind that pixel! Which pixel? Too late, you're dead. Start again. Oh yeah, I've got tons of things to say about Borderlands 3. Wait there, and I'll go get them. And so ends the year 2019. What a cascade of failure and pain it has been. Out came the games to not that much cheer, but lots of hostility and yawning and sneers that made all the publishers recoil in fear and push back the games that looked good to next year, but no amount of pushback would have been enough to lift our poor industry out of the trough of artless exploitational grindathon guff of loot box live service and all of that stuff. But anyway, to close out 2019, the best and the worst and the blandest I've seen. <laughs> it's true what they say, isn't it? You either die spec ops the line, or you live long enough to see yourself become the Call of Duty. It turns out that there was officially about one and a half good games in the Wolfenstein New Order continuity, and all that's left is Wolfenstein Youngblood, which came along, burst into tears, pissed itself, and ruined their attempt at an aristocrat's joke. <laughs> The RE2 make is RE2 fine, whatever, but I'm troubled by the announcement of the RE3 make. This is a can that can only be kicked down the road so many times, Capcom. Where does it end? Are you gonna end up taking another crack at Resident Evil 6? That'd be like when Europe took another crack at the bubonic plague. <coughs> Apocalypse, motorbikes, love triumphing through adversity, zombie hordes that poo on everything. It's weirdly impressive that Days Gone can have all of these things and still gravitate to total boredom like a compass needle to magnetic north. I blame the main character. You could dress Deacon St. John in a feather boa and fishnets and take him out seal clubbing and he'll just whinge the whole time about wanting to be in bed by ten. <laughs> A late entry into the worst games list, late as in the late Shenmue franchise, or indeed the late Sega Dreamcast, which died partly because Shenmue killed it. Its poor design and stiff characters made it funny once, but the laughter can't be sustained through its crushingly slow pace, so now it's just bad. If you don't stop giving you Suzuki money, Shenmue will kill again. Especially if you're allergic to shit. <coughs> I hate to be predictable, but somehow every fucking year Ubisoft tops its previous record for mindless live service overly monetized sandbox bullshit, this time with Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Apparently its failure caused Ubisoft to push back all its upcoming games to reassess things, meaning that it officially sucked hard enough to suck entertainment value out of the future as well. Yeah, I said I wasn't going to make this my game of the year, but that was before the rest of the year's games plopped out like marbles from the nose of a remedial student. But why qualify it? Disco Elysium is great, because it embodies three things that the games industry desperately needs to embrace. Intelligent writing, originality, and self-abuse. Anthem is mind-numbing live service tosh with fewer original ideas than a BBC daytime television commissioner, but that's not why it's topping my blandest list. The real reason? Because while I was writing down the obvious candidates, Days Gone, Ghost Recon, I suddenly noticed Anthem on the list of 2019 releases and thought, huh, I completely forgot about that. And that, viewers, is what gives you the edge in a mediocrity contest. I hate when publishers take the easy route by making cash-in live service looter games and slapping a familiar name onto it. Consider that for a moment. Contra Rogue Corps was taking the easy route, and they still fucked it up. It's sad that Konami turned evil. It's doubly sad that they're so fucking bad at it. Contra Rogue Corps is boring, lazy, and generally awful, and its attempt to bring across a Devil May Care sense of humour just adds insult to injury. Like being pursued by a monster clown that can't even be bothered to run fast or whip his dick out. Well, I've done my best, worst, and blandest video because I'm as steadfast and reliable as your preferred brand of water-based lubricant, but 2020 is an important year. It'll be a while before we see another year that can so perfectly form the frames of a pair of hilarious novelty spectacles. And it's the start of a new decade. Think of how far we've come in the last ten years. In 2010 I was stuck in a small yellow room complaining about video games and look at me now, I'm a little bit fatter with a slightly less functional dick. Rather than summarise ten years worth of best and worst games lists again, I mean who the fuck remembers Amy, besides whatever poor twat hinge invested in it and presumably now makes their Christmas dinner by peeling old lettuce leaves off the sides of compost bins, I'd like to run down a short list of my most significant games and gaming development from the last ten years, remembering that significant doesn't necessarily mean good. I mean, a metal straw pushed up my nostril until it penetrates my brain cavity would be a significant part of my day, but it'll mean a poor Yelp review for your milkshake shop. But if you want an exemplar, look no further than CD Projekt Red's 2015 hit The Witcher 3, which showed that if you want a compelling open world game, there really is no substitute for putting the fucking work in, imbuing even the least of its side quests with carefully crafted story and character to create a game from which rich narrative bleeds from every pore like the juices of a beautifully cooked roast. Plus you get to see lots of lovely girls 
girl's boobies. The Black Ops series, Yahtzee. Have you been mainlining Worcestershire sauce again? Think about it, viewer. With four games spanning from 2011 to 2018, is there any series that better encapsulates the state of spunk gargle wee wee modern shooters in the 2010s? It's like a barometer for shit. I have an office full of gaming machinery, but the Switch is the only device I keep in my living room to dick around with in my off hours. Because it's easy to set up, has a rich library of curated indies, and I have a pro controller now so I can actually play the fucking things without bending my hands into hideous claws fit only for stirring pasta water and bringing off female robots. And how could we forget Toby Fox's Undertale, a lovely indulgent scented bubble bath of a game, equal parts nostalgic, hilarious and moving, which I would probably call my game of the decade if I were in a room full of people wearing internet meme t-shirts. Dark Souls is what I'd call my game of the decade if the room was instead full of fat bearded dorks who unironically own swords. Real games never went away, Dark Souls was saying, they were here all along, waiting around a corner to twat you with a pole axe. Alright, that's enough retrospective videos. A wise man once told me, he who dwell on the past have eyeballs glued to his bum cheeks. Actually, he wasn't that wise. Valve announced that new VR Half-Life Alex game and immediately the expectation sprang almost as high as the stiffies, but on the off chance that anyone working on that gives a half cup of sifted shit for what I'd like to see, then I point to Boneworks and say, do you see this? Take this, give it a more coherent plot that doesn't just boil down to it is a VR game, and methinks doth not protest so much about whether or not it's a tech demo, ease off the contrived physics puzzles and improve the monster and weapon variety, and that'll do for me. Oh, is that all, Yahtzee? Anything else your expensive ivory tower escapism device can do to help you literally blind and deafen yourself to the ongoing horrors of reality that more and more of us are forced to live with, to the utter indifference of the openly corrupt liars and plutocrats that govern our lives, your imperial bloody majesty? Uh, Ghostbusters laser? What's that you say, tiny pilchard? Have I tried Pathologic too? Oh, for fuck's sake, not you as well. Look, I gave it a try, I found it dreary and inscrutable, alright? Maybe I'm just not smart enough to get it like you. Why don't you sod off back to your little intellectual enclave in the fridge and discuss the merits of Cartesian dualism with the I can't believe it's not butter while I drag my Neolithic brow over to the Epic Store to play a game about smashing toy robots together? I am not getting defensive! Do you wanna fight? The Battlemech loadout interface is all columns and boxes and useless information like a spreadsheet submitted as evidence in a fraud case in the hope of boring the jury to death. And then you find it's mostly pointless to fuck around with because the weapons already on your mechs by default are usually better than the ones you find and in any case your weapon slots are all fussy little bitches that will only consent to holding weapons of a specific type and specific size that were manufactured after 1980 in a cruelty-free facility. As I said, Sex Wiggles 5 is the sort of thing that would probably really appeal to someone, just nobody I'd relish taking a long car journey with. So let's move on to the other game I played on the Epic Store this week, Watam. Or to give it its full title, What a Massive Waste of Time. No, bad Yahtzee. Watam is the new game by Keita Takahashi, dude who made the excellent Katamari Damacy, which you'd think would recommend him, but he followed up Katamari with a game called Nobby Nobby Boy, which was less game than pissing about simulator, and between that and Watam, it's now clear to me that Katamari Damacy was a freak incident, when Keita Takahashi and the concept of gameplay briefly aligned with each other before their opposing trajectories sent them both flying away into space. Watam's blurb states that it's a game about friendship, but I don't agree that it is. What this game is really saying is that the only way to be accepted by society and your peers is to blindly follow instructions and that if someone chews you up and shits you out you should just be grateful for the attention. So apparently it's a metaphor for your first job after leaving college. I hate when people say the human race is destroying the planet. Bitch, the human race can't even invent a permanent system of government that doesn't eventually lead to societal collapse. What the fuck do you think we could possibly do to worry a giant billion year old rock? No, the only thing the human race is destroying is the human race. And life on earth goes on regardless. Oh sure, there are a lot of homeless koalas in the world right now thanks to climate change, but I'm sure the cockroaches and the urban foxes will remember us all quite fondly when they're ruling over the remnants of our cities. Climate change reversal, don't do it for the forest or the little hoppy bunnies. Do it so you can keep sitting on your fat ass stuffing sustainably sourced Pringles into that slime covered catcher's mitt you call a face. Feel free to use that slogan uncredited, ecological groups. At its core it plays like the Metroid Prime-esque ability-gated Metroidvania crossed with the hunting and crafting element of, say, Subnautica. And this is where the mechanics have their biggest car crash, because when we find the Pig Viagra upgrade that allows us to explore all the areas that can only be reached by grappling onto the extruding stiffies of pigs, we can't actually start doing that until we go back to our ship and craft the upgrade, which is a bit of a grinding of gears from a flow perspective because the place where you found the upgrade might be thick with sexually engorged boars, all ripe for the molesting. But you've still got to go back to the starting location first. And this is assuming you have the crafting materials. If you don't have the carbon, it's back to massacring starting enemies, until you realise that starting enemies drop more carbon if you feed them and wait for them to poo it out. And that's when you find yourself thinking, I am a seasoned adventurer! Why am I back in the fucking starting area, waiting to harvest a turd from a spherical owl so that I can go fluff a bunch of pigs? The Walking Dead Saints and Sinners, another bloody spin-off from The Walking Dead. That shit spun off more times than a poorly secured fan belt. Maybe it would be simpler to just declare that every zombie property is a Walking Dead spin-off. That way we can put all the zombie apocalypse crap into one convenient basket that we can then drop kick off a pier at our leisure. Also, there's that better variety of guns I was asking for, including shotguns and revolvers and explosives, but somehow they don't have the same satisfying feel. It's the little things. It's the sound. It's the slime 
besides being a bit more finicky. It's the way ammunition doesn't go into the gun so much as disappear the moment it's vaguely near it. Gun Tor accepts your sacrifice. You are granted a boon of six more dead cunts. Not that Walking Dead Bangers and Mash needs much gun variety, considering every enemy dies from a single headshot from the starting pistol. Even if you don't trust your aim, you can easily grab a zombie's forehead and hold him there while you put the gun to his chin, stab him in the eye, write swear words on his face and felt tip. Whatever you want, he can't do shit. As after I finished the final level, seen my unsatisfying ending and gone into post-credits mode, I looked over the arsenal of weapons I'd assembled and barely used, and wondered if there had been a point to any of it. I decided then to load up all my weapons, go out into the city, and finally see what happens if you stay out past the time limit when the bells ring and all the zombies allegedly go bananas. So I did that, and this really dramatic music started playing, some angry zombies shambled over and I shot them all in the head. Then I listened to the dramatic music for a bit, then I got bored and went home. It was like working security at a disappointing Pink Floyd concert. But there aren't many games that are akin to the experience of, say, walking around an art museum, of slowly gliding through silent, mostly empty rooms, standing in front of an installation and inspecting it with a finger to your chin as you think to yourself, hmm, I am bored out of my fucking skull. I hope that attractive cloakroom attendant is watching and thinking what a cool and sexy intellectual I must be because I would desperately rather be playing Crash Bandicoot. Kentucky Route Zero might be best classified as a point-and-click adventure, although adventure implies things like puzzles and challenge and adversity, so we might more accurately use the phrase point-and-click sequence. In Kentucky Route Zero you play Conway, an ageing truck driver in an ageing truck on a job to deliver antiques from a shop that's about to close down. Is that enough elements establishing the theme of entropy yet, viewers? What if we also give the truck driver a bad leg, and a t-shirt with everything fucking dies on the front in big letters? Struggling to find an address that doesn't seem to exist, Conway is directed by various mysterious figures to the Route Zero, a mysterious world of underground tunnels and secret backroads where dwelleth a forgotten vein of Middle America. What follows is a melancholy odyssey reminiscent of Alice in Wonderland if it were directed by David Lynch and if all the talking doorknobs and shit were replaced with struggling small business owners. In the fourth chapter you're all on a boat and suddenly there's this theremin player on the squad, and I honestly couldn't remember if she'd been properly introduced or just turned up in the background like mildew in the shower. And then chapter five introduces a whole town full of new characters and the already faint sliver of shit that I currently give for these people's lives has to be divided even further and nobody's getting a full dingleberry. But Kentucky Route Zero wouldn't even let me into the third chapter until I watched an entire three-act play. Not a fun play, like that one with the horse where Harry Potter gets his knob out, a pretentious student play, where three characters sit unmoving in a diner verbally skating around the fucking point for 20 minutes. It would even fucking pause if I wasn't directing the camera at whoever's turn it was to speak, ensuring there was no escape, and forcing me to become an instrument of my own torment, the way my mum used to glue thumbtacks to the palms of my hands before I went to bed. Didn't fucking stop me mum, just means I get awkward stiffies when I go to office max now. Call me a philistine, but gameplay and challenge can actually be a useful tool for pacing a story, and going without is like a film going without proper editing, or getting thrown out of office max before you can climax over the tipex. Their ship kinda came in with the Sniper Elite franchise, which has been distinctly dominating their release list since 2012, but if there's one thing that's more easy and pandering than the Second World War, the last war with a solid face and heel that didn't break kayfabe, it's those motherfucking zombies. So they made a zombie mode, because Call of Duty did it, and if Call of Duty jumped off a bridge then, well firstly Battlefield would jump too, and then Rebellion would follow after about five years of staring vacantly into space. So it's an alternative World War II where the Nazis resorted to necromantic black magic, which must have brought on a fresh round of are we the baddies pontificating on the infantry's part, but mercifully they were all swiftly too zombified to care. Europe is now mostly zombie infested wasteland and it's up to you and three of your chums to take back the 20 or 30 square feet of remaining habitable land by fighting off a coordinated assault of the undead, destroying a few towers from hell, and killing zombie Hitler or something else entirely fucking obvious. There's one level on a boat with mounted guns where you keep sailing past areas full of zombies but there's no way for the zombies to get to you, so I think it was where you're supposed to be competing with the other players for points, but I'm as friendless as ever so I just stood around picking my nose for five minutes. Yahtzee, sorry to interrupt, but why are you even covering this game with less new ideas than the ceremony planning committee at the Academy Awards? Is it that you are now officially an epic store shill? First of all, it's on consoles as well, and second of all, fuck you for derailing the comments again. Hey kids, are you making a fantasy game but are having trouble coming up with a title? Try this simple trick. Take a word from word list A and one from word list B, stick of or of the in between the two, and you're ready to go. If you're really advanced, smash together the names of your two favourite pieces of IKEA furniture and stick that on the front with a colon on the end. What the fuck is Walson? Is it the protagonist, the country that the game happens in, the name of the medication your character gets prescribed for his chronic pauldron chafing? Who fucking cares? Maybe it's what the dude on the cover art calls his beard. Seems like the sort of beard that has its own name and postcode. So I was playing most of it kind of zoned out and the plot was just something that occasionally shook me awake like a boring maths teacher suddenly popping out a tit. As I said, it's a PC RPG and it's not fucking around with that. I did tokenly try to use my controller but all it did was make the cursor move around and none of the buttons worked as if the game was saying, ooh look at that shiny whiny cursor you're moving around all by yourself with your magic lump of colourful Fisher Price plastic. Do let us know when your daddy gets home so we can play the real game with all the other grown ups. So I was merrily cheesing my way through the game when the difficulty curve suddenly brick walled my ass at a certain boss fight, largely because my freezy spell didn't work on the bastard so that set my whole routine out of whack and I had to rely on the fucking stupid dodge mechanic where you 
your dodge stamina is tucked away in a tiny, barely noticeable part of the interface, and if you don't have any, your character just stands there daydreaming about pencils as the enemy carves up your buttocks like birthday cake. But I knuckled down and eventually managed to get through the second stage of the boss. Unfortunately, it was a three-stage boss. When his health inexplicably came back a second time and the game looked at my exhausted ass and went, what now, Mayor McCheese? I decided that was enough for me. Thanks. Walson, bored of playing as a single-player experience, is like working a data entry job where your outbox is linked to a pressure switch that will at some undetermined point set fire to your armpits. It prompts little beyond boredom and complains to the temp agency. Yahtzee, do you have dreams? Of course I have dreams. I dream of the day you stop breaking into my house to ask me stupid questions. I dream of finding a commercial grade air freshener that covers the smell from the basement. No, I mean, do you have dreams on the PS4? The new game, well, game tangent creativity experience by the people who made Little Big Planet, who appear to be trying to pull off the same scam where they get young creatives to pay to make their content for them. The intro and tutorial dialogue has the tone of a kindergarten teacher handing out gold stars to everyone for all being equally special. Welcome to a magical universe of your very own where you can realise your wildest imaginings as long as they're slightly twee. Bit I can realise my wildest imaginings with a blank wall and a handful of shit. You didn't invent creativity. The invention of creativity occurred in 1988 when Robert Zemeckis directed Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and you don't look much like Robert Zemeckis. I feel like making a game in dreams would be like cleaning a bathroom floor with the eyelashes of a horse. Impressive, yes, but there were much easier ways, and you'll have very little use for all that horse wrangling expertise you had to learn if you want to move into cleaning bathroom floors on a professional level. Even more so after Sony inevitably decides it can't be bothered to support clean bathroom floors anymore and turns the servers off, sending everyone's hard work right down the bathroom drain. Yes, I have completely lost the fucking thread of this metaphor. I made sure to leave a like on the small number of games that I felt got into the right spirit of things, offering nice straightforward gameplay loops, occasionally even original ones. And as I looked around at the colourful menus and the careful curation algorithms at work, I found myself thinking, you know, it'll be a real shame when this all gets taken over by perverts. These things always are, Media Molecule. The Sonic the Hedgehog fans are the warning sign. Now, Sonic fans aren't necessarily perverts. Basketball players aren't necessarily tall, but it fucking helps! Sooner or later they bring in that one character who's a bat with tits and the furries have got a foot in your door. Remember Second Life? Once a lovely wholesome attempt at a community-created online world of imagination, now just zebra dicks and yiff piles as far as the eye can see? Doom was released by id Software in 1993 and was a culmination of two significant events, John Karma creating a revolutionary new 3D graphics engine for first-person games, and John Romero spilling ketchup all over his collection of Metallica albums. The result was the conflux of both a technical and a cultural revolution. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like to see it for the first time, getting the same heavily fudged 2D planes from Wolfenstein 3D to simulate angled walls and floors with multiple levels must have been like finding a way to play the trombone with your rectum. So in summary, with Doom's days as a groundbreaker long behind it, it can still at least offer an invigorating simplicity when you're tired of the self-important posturing of new games. Don't get me wrong, I like the innovations of the modern toilet, but there's still something uniquely satisfying about going out into my front garden and pissing on a political canvasser. But now I have a new problem, because sometimes games stay in early access the whole time they're in the popular zeitgeist, so by the time I review it no one cares, and I've all moved on to John Madden's Felching Simulator 2020. Black Mesa was announced 15 years ago and been in early access for five. I assume they've been waiting until the kitschy retro factor kicks in since they missed the first chance to strike while the panty was wet. As a critic this has been a right pinecone up my perineum. Back when I first played Black Mesa in those wonderful days before all sense left the earth, I had tons of shit to critic about but they kept throwing up the early access card like a crucifix to a vampire. Hey where are the zen levels? Early access? <sighs> Hey, the enemy soldiers seem a bit too accurate. Early access! Oh, for fuck's sake. And now I'm roundly miffed to see that the release version of Black Mesa is really fucking polished, which is all anyone should expect, since they've been polishing it for so fucking long there's a six inch layer of crystallised Mr. Sheen around the thing. And it suddenly seems odd that no one Gordon Freeman meets as he fights his way out of the doomed facility wants to come with him. Quick, Gordon, rescue teams are meeting us on the surface. I'll open this door for you, let me know how it works out. What, me? No, I couldn't possibly come too. There might be something you need to crouch under, or a one foot high obstacle. It's probably safest for me to hang out in this alien infested corridor. Maybe stick my underpants on my head and try to live among the parasite monsters like Diane fucking Fossey. Black Mesa's Zen is three or four times longer than the original, which I'm not sure is the solution I'd have gone for. Oh, you don't want your broccoli? Well here's three times as much, bitch, and if you don't learn to like it I'm going to start pushing it up your nose. In summary, Half-Life was a handsome, intelligent and smartly dressed man who was inexplicably wearing one bright green Wellington boot. I don't think the solution was to put on the other Wellington boot. The usual indie arty platformer theme of small innocent child in big scary world is like the missionary position. There's nothing inherently wrong with it, some interesting things have been done with it, but when it's all you fucking do, you'll swiftly be desperately hankering to break the monotony with just one suck job or nipple clamp. You might reasonably think from looking at the promotional art, I almost said box art there, but come on, like anyone buys games in boxes, from shops, like a twat. Once again, the nebulous negative force we're up against is the darkness, which has no agenda beyond making all the nice people sad, and the local boss monsters bastards, requiring that we help out through therapeutic beating the glowing snot out of them. Look, I know 
know this isn't Tinker Tailor Soldier Cat Rabbit thing, and I shouldn't expect complex plotting from my fantasy animal platformers, but the mythic tone and sweeping soundtrack makes me think that it thinks its story is epic and profound when it's actually kind of shallow. Drive out the darkness and restore the light. Ooh, good idea. Maybe I wouldn't bump into things so much. Oh, hark at Mr. Grumpy Pants reaching for things to complain about because it's easier than changing into a pair of trousers that's more positive spirited. All right, it's still a beautiful game, and when it isn't pausing to very cinematically wank the budget off on screen, the core platforming gameplay is fun and skillful, although I hate how we only have three ability slots mapped to three of the face buttons, because one of those abilities is your standard attack, which you will never unequip, and at least one of them needs to be whatever traversal power gets you through the current area, so really you've only got one free slot. And I've got all this money, and the merchant's children are starving and eating each other's toenail clippings to survive, but I don't want to fucking buy any of the merchant's fancy combat abilities, because I only have one slot and I don't want to have to keep pausing the game to remap my controls mid-combat like I'm trying to drive a car with a starving Tamagotchi on the passenger seat because someone's never heard of button combinations. Oh dear, Grumpy Pants is back from the dry cleaners. Doom Eternal this, Doom Eternal that, the children are dying. Doom Eternal! Hey, I finished cleaning the menswear section of this department store, which section should I do next? Oh, could you Doom Eternal? Doom Eternal! But as for how- The Doom Slayer got here. Maybe that was explained in a DLC or a comic book somewhere. And incidentally, I do appreciate how it's now canon that the Doom Slayer does actually talk like he did in the Doom comic book, like an abattoir worker on enough coke to floor an elephant seal. Oh, who the fuck needs context, Yards? It's fast arcadey fun combat. Did you miss the instructions? Step one, rip. Step two, tear. Step three, lunch. What you're talking about, viewer, is combat having a sense of abandon and catharsis, but I have trouble getting into that mood when every time I burst into a room full of low-level mobs I have to stop and weigh things up. Hmm, health and armor both need a boost. Should I set fire to these lads before I chainsaw their legs off. The more strategic nature of it might turn some people off if they'd rather just pull out the super shotgun, say, hey does this barrel smell like cordite to you, and change the atmosphere of the room from 70% nitrogen to 90% vaporized sexual organ. Oh, for those happier times when I was a youthful carefree murderer. And it's funny how the game is leaning more into the arcadey retro vibe with the redesigned pickups and simultaneously leaning more into serious storytelling, which is about as welcome in my Doom 2016 as a jittery skunk in an eyewash station. The Doom Slayer is an unfettered chaotic id who only wants to kill demons and find collectible Happy Meal toys. In other words, he's the player of a mindless shooter game. But the central gag of the character is that all the other characters in the plot are looking for meaning and cosmic stroke religious significance in his actions where none truly exists. He just doesn't give a shit. That's the joke. Very funny. Ha ha ha. But in Doom Eternal, when there are entire levels devoted to traipsing through empty hallways learning the history of the Doom Slayer and the origin story for how he came to not give a shit, and we're beset by cutscenes and dialogue and codex entries filling us in on the makers of Urdak and their history with the Sentinels of Argent new and their long tradition of shit and the not giving thereof, then suddenly the game itself is the one projecting unnecessary meaning onto the dude who doesn't actually give a shit, and the joke is at the expense of the story writers. How does it compare to my old Oculus Rift? Well, the image is crisper and it doesn't take up 15 USB ports, it just takes up 19 power sockets instead. That's not true. In reality it takes up 3 power sockets, and isn't it a shame that I have to break character to clarify that because some of you mouth breathers don't understand exaggeration for comic effect and think hyperbole is what Sony's PR department eats cereal out of. Yes, I know it's pronounced hyperbole, I couldn't think of a better joke. Be gone! ye fan-made golden calves of slack beta and cunt down the wee-wees, Half-Life Alex is a continuation of the Half-Life canon intended to be the hot app that VR still kinda needs. Oh, how necessary to the canon can it be, Yahtzee? Surely we'll be going through the plot knowing that nothing permanent can happen because it's a prequel set five years before Gordon Freeman shows up and wipes everyone's bumsies. That's what I thought, but then the ending suddenly pulled my trousers right down and started affecting the established plot. So since I don't want to spoil it, sorry Half-Life fans, better crack open those swear jars and start a VR fund. Or more realistically, watch someone on YouTube play it. But otherwise, Alex is my new exemplar for VR narrative action games. It's engaging in all the ways that count, and it being an official entry for a big franchise is a significant step for VR, becoming less of a janky novelty. But will it be what finally breaks VR into the mainstream- no. No, this is what I as a VR enthusiast have come to accept, listeners. Every big mainstream success in the last two decades of video games has been about making them more casual or more social, and VR is the antithesis to both. You can't craftily alt-tab into it when you're supposed to be working, unless you've got pathologically unobservant supervisors, and you can't do it while hanging out with friends, unless you really want them to leave and they missed all the other hints you dropped. I wasn't going to bring up the coronavirus thing again, I mean the site's called The Escapist, not the constant reminders of our inevitable hubristic doom. Besides, it'll pretty seriously date the videos in a month or two when the virus goes away for forever and everything returns to normal and all the dead people come back to life and there's a rainbow. I don't know if it's worth analysing the subtext of a game about a giant muscular man refusing to leave alone an attractive underdressed lady and trying to penetrate her with his big floppy willy of death. She is at least better dressed than she was in the original, when she looks like an embarrassing single mother accompanying her daughter to a roller disco. But still, Three Make sometimes gives me a Tomb Raider make vibe when the amount of shit that gets kicked out of Jill Valentine starts to border on the fetishistic. No, I don't think I sound disingenuous when I get finger waggy about this kind of thing, it's not like I jerked off to it more than once. 
Here's your loading screen tip. Hunters are close range fighters. Remember to back up and keep your distance. Three make- you're making me fight these things in a fucking hospital corridor! What am I supposed to back up into? The fucking vending machine coin return slots? Perhaps you'd have a better time in the multiplayer mode, Yards. And you know what's really taking the piss is that outside the rather anemic campaign badly in need of a Mars bar and some exercise, there aren't even any other gameplay modes. No mercenaries mode, no extra challenges, I mean what the fuck were they even working on this whole time? Probably the multiplayer, Yards. Why don't you play some of it? Hello, Doctor. I'm hearing the voices again. The ones that keep telling me to hurt myself. The setup this time around is that you and the predatory raccoon loan shark, Tom Nook, have come to a desert island wilderness in order to develop it into yet another wholesome capitalist paradise for animal shaped random number generators. You know, the kind of setup where, if it were a film, you'd expect half the cast to be cannibalised by the end of Act 2. But don't worry, Tom Nook presumably massacred the native island population before we arrived. The process of developing the island largely entails, for your part, the transfer of ungodly amounts of bells from you to Tom Nook's holdings account, and the usual Animal Crossing routine quickly sets in. You fish, you catch bugs, you acquire furniture, you sell it all to Tom Nook for money that you then use to pay off your loans to Tom Nook. It's the all Tom Nook economy. When Tom Nook dies, this entire society will fucking collapse into anarchy where brightly coloured animal people shiv each other for pears. But I managed to gain a new perspective on animal tossing this time around by introducing my wife to it. Now be warned before you show your significant other or cohabitant Animal Crossing that it's a risky play. On the one hand they won't yell at you to stop playing video games for a while, but on the other the house will rot and the children will starve. I'm ashamed to admit that I knew Animal Crossing would suck her in, because she's one of those 100% completion types who have always ensured that Pokemon makes bank like a 7-Eleven across the road from a marijuana shop. So on day one she was saying she probably wouldn't be into it, and by day five she was staying up fishing long into the night because she had to catch just one fucking sturgeon before the end of March. And by day eight she was digging holes in a series of arcane patterns in the hope of summoning a tarantula to catch, and I began to worry that she might have joined a cargo cult. But do you like Animal Crossing's New Horizons, Yahtzee? Say that's the wrong question. Of course I don't, but I still play it. It's full of little annoyances I could nitpick about, but I strongly suspect it's the flaws that make it absorbing. Of course smacking rocks doesn't just drop crafting resources, it has to parcel them out based on how many times you can smack it in ten seconds, so you feel motivated to try and beat that record. Of course we can't skip the interminably repetitive dialogue and fish puns, because our eventual payout from the morning's fishing will be all the sweeter for having put in the slog. Of course the owl always says the same fucking thing, because if they said something different for once we'd all be struck with terror at the sudden injection of chaos into our ordered little world, the way a suburban community reacts when a black person moves in. I know most people come here for knob gags, or because you refuse to believe I'm actually still doing this every week, but for those of you coming for purchasing advice, be apprised of two things before you buy Final Fantasy VII Remake. Firstly, if you go in the shop and make the ooh this Final Fantasy's going on an awfully long time joke, then I think the staff are now legally permitted to push you down a fire escape. And secondly, if you saw the title Final Fantasy VII Remake, and from the words Final Fantasy VII and Remake are now expecting a remake of the game Final Fantasy VII, then you might be disappointed. Final Fantasy VII Remake ends at the bit where you leave the first city, or about one third of the way through the first disc of the original PS1 game. Although it takes about 40 more hours to get there, because it's padded like an A cup on school picture day, so there's been some contention over whether this is false advertising or a new take on the subject matter with better character exploration. The storytelling feels confused. Not confusing, confused. There's this whole new chapter between terrorists bombing 1 and 2, in which Cloud gets latched onto by Manic Pixie Dream Girl 1.5, and it's all over the place like a living room full of aborted Lego projects. First there's a motorbike chase, and then a motorbike boss fight with a mulleted dude who feels threatened by your motorbike prowess and nicer hairdo, then we have to sneak around someone's mum's house and the pace slows right down, before speeding right back up again when we go to a facility to battle some evil corporate soldiers, and then oh no, mullet dude shows up for another boss fight, and then oh no, evil robots come to kill us, but oh yay, mullet dude smashes the robots because he respects us now, but then he fucks off and oh no, the robots are still working so what was the fucking point of any of that, then oh yay, a rival terrorist cell shows up to cover our escape, but oh no, they've taken Wedge, but oh yay, Wedge comes straight back, and then a prolonged sequence ensues where our heroes pull Wedge's trousers down and inspect his buttocks. As I say, confused, like they were tag teaming out the writers every ten minutes and they weren't allowed to talk to each other. Hey, remember when games had actual depth? Slap! No you don't! Hey, remember when you could go out to that frozen yoghurt place you like? Slap! No more of that! Hey, remember when you could get off on light BDSM? No slap! Oh you tease. Remember the Bureau? Remember XCOM Enforcer? Nobody else does! Don't worry Yahtzee, our new game Chimera Squad has all the turn-based isometric action crossed with base management that you love. Well, like a blind dog on a crowded escalator, I'm sensing an upcoming but, but it's XCOM if it were a Saturday morning cartoon. I'm going to follow you down this rabbit hole XCOM, but at the first sign of cave-in I'm heading back and telling everyone you wanked yourself to death. I ended up having to play through every level at least twice, because it's hard to get a feel for the boss's attacks and weaknesses on your very first attempt while they're relentlessly smashing you in the face so hard that bogeys shoot out of your ass. so I'd run out of 
lives and the game would get very fucking cute and say, would you like to replay the level with one additional life in return for taking half points? Firstly, feet of strange roar, why didn't you tell me that was an option before I went out and embarrassed myself? And secondly, save your charity for fucking tax season. I know myself, and I know exactly what would happen if I had one extra life. I'd get overconfident and swiftly lose it from something stupid, like falling off a ledge or forgetting to breathe. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. Back in the day, WoW was the front runner in the field of games that are second jobs where you have to pay to come to work. And you can't be that popular for that long and that full of fancy twats like a cosmetic gynaecologist's example catalogue without generating a few jolly interesting moments in gaming history. Like that time someone tried to hold a funeral for a real person and it got invaded by trolls. Because what the fuck did they expect? Hey Mr Troll, here's an opportunity to be the most inappropriate you'll ever be in your life. Pinky promise not to take it? It's like asking the school bullies to please not kick you in the balls because you have a tendency to make very embarrassing squeals. And then there's the subject of today's video, a suddenly relevant incident from 2005 in which World of Warcraft had to deal with an insidious globe scarring plague other than itself. On September 13th, 2005, players joined the server of Archimond. World of Warcraft had this thing where they named servers from a 19th century book of baby names for very out of touch upper middle class people, and spawned in their preferred hub city to bask in the glow of patch 170. Then all of a sudden one of them coughed, then coughed again, then their health bar turned inside out and all their blood exploded. Soon every player in the near vicinity was turning into an Ebola fountain as the unkillable NPCs smilingly plied their trade awash in infected phlegm, ensuring that not even constant mass player genocide could stop the breakout. What the fuck was going on? An unannounced world event? The fanboys began dutifully praising Blizzard's innovative spirit and chiding the complainers for not getting it as they died in helpless agony over and over again, and meanwhile the Blizzard offices became ankle deep in anxious urine trying to figure out why this was happening. The answer it turned out lay in a newly introduced raid instance called Zulgarub, which you'll notice an anagram of buggers up if you spell it completely wrong. The infection was in fact a debuff called Corrupted Blood, intended to spread from player to player but not intended to exist outside of Zulgarub's final boss fight with Hakkar the Soul Flayer. Yeah, everything in World of Warcraft was named like that. You have to remember, Fortnite players, that this was before your generation invented irony. The disease was supposed to go away after the subject died or killed Hakkar the Bull Fondler, but like an irresponsible holidaymaker, Blizzard forgot about the fucking pets. Players whose pets contracted corrupted blood during the boss fight would despawn the pets before they died and said pets would be preserved in stasis infection and all until the next time they were let out to go plop plops in the overworld. On the one hand, there were the rubberneckers, people logging in who wanted to see all this interesting carnage they'd heard about because this was only four years since the 9-11 attacks and there'd been nothing since then that had made for quite as good television. And then there were the trolls, the griefers, and oh boy this was like all their snow days had come at once and they were going to do everything they could to keep it going. Some of them started hiding out in the mountains, continually reinfecting each other so at the first sign of the infection clearing up somewhere they could run down and lick all the doorknobs. So between them and the tourists it was clear that the plague was never going to get a chance to clear up. And so Blizzard had no option but to contact one of the figureheads of the quarantine effort and have him construct a giant wooden boat in which he was directed to place two of every monster so that they could send a rainstorm for 40 days and 40 nights. Now I'm fucking with you, they just hard reset the servers. If you enlightened viewers in the modern age of less blurry screenshots are seeing some eerie parallels between the corrupted blood incident and certain real life current events, you aren't alone. In fact, academics took an interest in the incident for what it might tell us about real life pandemics, particularly the sociological effects. But others argued that it taking place in a video game with zero real life consequences limited the usefulness of the data. After all, it's not like people in the real world would just casually blow off an official quarantine order when there's honest to goodness life and death on the line. Dear me, no. For me, it's nice to see something confirmed that I could have told these academics at any time. That if they want a case study for the most irrational behaviour of which human beings are capable, then a good place to start might be the people who willingly pay a monthly subscription to waste their free time scraping up imaginary murloc bellends. Did you play anything interesting or relevant, Yahtzee? Not really, I spent most of the week leaning on jukeboxes and making double finger guns at the sexy honeys. Hey, that's cool with me because I'm super cash, so what did you play? Well I did play quite a bit of Void Bastards, because the title drew me in with two of my favourite things, nihilism and swearing. The narrator makes a search the network of derelicts for the specific crafting items that will advance the plot, and the plot usually advances to find another bunch of specific crafting items. It makes me think of when people told me to give Pathologic a chance and I said it made me bored and confused and they said, that's the idea, it's a game designed to evoke the banality and confusion of being a sad Russian doctor that everyone wants to punch. In which case I congratulate the excellent job it did realising those intentions, but I'm still not going to play it anymore. And I wonder if Void Bastards has a similar thing going on, that it might be trying to evoke the central theme by making you feel like you're trapped forever in a repetitive bureaucratic purgatory. So let's talk about another game I still haven't finished, Ion Fury. Hey, that's also a retro style sprite based FPS, and it also just came out on consoles. Is this a theme? No, we don't need a theme, we're super cash, fuck you. I mean, hey. So we have the classic build engine environment, that so effectively recreate urban cityscapes made out of giant cereal boxes, the usual fast-paced, no-frills shooty action of retro-style FPS, and most importantly all those wonderful dated pop culture references that speckle build engine shooters like itchy red spots on a dose of the clap. Uh oh, here she comes. Watch out boys, she'll chew you up. 
There, now you've got that song stuck in your head too, you're fucking welcome. So do you want another masterclass in giving your opinion away in the very first sentence? Here goes, Maneater is a concept that feels like it could have worked. Maneater is a game in which you, as a shark, beat yourself and then lollop around a sandbank like a space hopper full of custard, chowing down on screaming ambulatory kebab after screaming ambulatory kebab, who are so utterly helpless to stop you they might as well douse themselves in garlic sauce and get it over with. I think the developers were banking on the spectacle of a shark biting a dude in half somehow never getting old, and granted watching someone's son or daughter's hopes and dreams for their existence vanish in a screaming cloud of gore and teeth is fucking hilarious, but as the core activity of a six hour open world game, after a while I need more context. Who is this random fat person paddling across the surface like a blob of cum in a municipal pool? Do they regret their choices in life? Are they swimming in the sea because the day had finally come to turn things around and get some exercise? That might add some poignancy to my reducing them to my morning protein smoothie, but no, it's just another copy pasted human silhouette to add to the body count. If you want to be charitable, and I mean really charitable, like massively profitable corporation two weeks before tax season charitable, you might say Maneater is offering a power fantasy in which you, the unstoppable, all-powerful apex predator, glide unchallenged through the deep, and all those self-important little swimmers up above live only by the grace of your satisfied tum-tum. That being the case, I wish someone would explain this to the fucking barracudas and every other low-level predator that keeps wanting to start shit, no matter how large and horrifying I get. Look, the health and XP I get from eating you are a pittance at this point, just go home and jerk off and yell at your barracuda wife if you want to feel better. I am swimming away to try to be the bigger man. Not that I need to try, because I'm the size of a fucking bus. So after Microsoft bought Minecraft, they must have said, ha ha! Ah, it's mine, all Minecraft. And we got it away from Notch before he went too weird on us. Now what shall we do with it? And in reply, the thought waves of the Microsoft corporate hive mind emitted only cricket noises. Telltale Games came along and said, Hey, I know, let's make a choices matter except not really episodic adventure game. Oh, piss off, Telltale Games. You tried to turn my last colonic endoscopy video into a choices matter except not really episodic adventure game. And so Minecraft Dungeons had to be made. A game that is the equivalent of moving your hand in a circular motion and going, Eeeh, because you feel obliged to say something, anything, to fill the silence. In case I wasn't making this clear, I believe there's a fun fundamental issue with Minecraft Dungeons on the conceptual level. It's an isometric hack and slash dungeon crawler for up to four players, and while yes there are swords in Minecraft, and yes there are things you can hit with the sword in Minecraft, it was never more than an incidental hassle to make it all the more satisfying when you finally finished your roller coaster shaped like Nicki Minaj lying on her back, or whatever your project was. To base your spin-off around something so incidental to the point of Minecraft is to spin right off it, out the garage, and down a storm drain. If you are determined to have fun with Minecraft Dungeons like it was the only thing your mother got you for your birthday and she's going to break out the wire coat hanger if you don't seem appreciative, then you might well find fun or at the very least distraction from what sounds like a very unhealthy home environment. But the point is, the inoffensiveness of the gameplay makes it as substantial as a puff of air. And Minecraft Dungeons is as much Minecraft as a balloon with a Minecraft logo printed on it. Shantae and the Seven Sirens, as well as being a title tailor-made to get the maximum amount of spit all over my laptop screen, is a retro-style platformer by WayForward Games with an art style reminiscent of a certain genre of Japanese anime, the kind that projects a wholesome, upbeat, innocent vibe but is somehow at the same time unrelentingly horny. Shantae's thesis statement is made in the very first frame of the opening cinematic, which is a zoomed in shot of the main character's bare midsection as it writhes about like a freshly neutered cat trying to lick its own balls. But hey, maybe this says more about me than Shantae. Sure, every pose Shantae adopts during dialogue sequences in some way involves stretching or leaning forward, but maybe her back hurts. Maybe I'm just projecting the horniness I brought to the table. So let's talk about the game. It kinda sucks. Oh well, back to the tits. All of this goes together to make an almost insultingly easy game. The only bit I found remotely challenging was the final boss against Mecha Girl in Bikini Top, because all the platforms were moving, so the usual pro strat of standing one place and whip your hair back and forth, whip your hair back and forth, didn't work so well. Even then, the main skill being tested was my ability to know when to strategically duck into the menu and inhale another cream bun from my trouser pantry. pants -ry? No, maybe not. I'd seen Shantae games crop up before on Steam, and I assumed it was just more retro platformers from new indie developers to add to the pile, with the one unique selling point that it was apparently being drawn one-handed. But no, I looked it up, and the first Shantae game came out in 2002. It was on the Game Boy Color, for fuck's sake. Shantae's nearly 20 years old, which does make me feel better about masturbating to it. In the spirit of inquiry, I tried the previous Shantae game, Half Genie Hero, and you know what? It's not bad at all. The environments were lively and interesting, the gameplay was challenging, the first couple of bosses were jiggling bikini girls, yes, but incredibly, the next one wasn't. Also, Shantae's dancing actually looked like dancing and not her exaggerating her fishing accomplishments. So Seven Sirens is apparently a developer getting lazy rather than not knowing any better, but man cannot live on horn alone. What happened to the ambition, WayForward Games? What happened to the creative drive that brought us, uh, Silent Hill Book of Memories? Wait, what? That was you? Well, fucking forget I said anything. Less ambition, please. Bikini tops all round. Of all boyhood fantasies, the ones before a certain age at any rate, before the hormones kick in and they all start to centre around your most attractive female teacher wielding a metre stick, there are none so enduring as the frontier cowboy fantasy. Who among us has not hooked their thumbs into their jeans while waiting for a bus, or tried on a long duster coat they found in a charity shop and then looked at themselves in the reflection off a window and thought, man, I would be so much cooler if I smelled like shit. 24-7, without having to move to downtown San Francisco. A helpful tutorial walks you through the basics. Here's how to move. Right, here's 
the quick save button. Yep. Here's how to toss a coin to make someone look the other way. Classic stuff. Here's the quick save button. You already mentioned that. Did I? Yes, in those gigantic flaming letters over there. Oh, just making sure you know. Well, I know now, thank you, Desperados 3. Desperados 3? Yes. Why is there a dirty great counter smack in the middle of the screen? Oh, that's just showing how long it's been since you last saved. In case you forget. Have you saved lately? Maybe you should. Why the obsession with quick saving? What are you? A drive through evangelist? Desperados 3 is the patron saint of Cock Up Cascade. The cocks barely have a chance to come down again. The enemies all have visibility cones spread wider than your mum's legs when she hears a bottle opener, and you can only see one guard's cone at a time. On top of that, a lot of guards who look like they're staring straight ahead are in fact glancing back and forth like a nervous gazelle at a tennis match covering an area the size of a conservatively proportioned aircraft hangar. So half the time you'll settle into the nice long slitting a throat animation and only then be informed that someone off screen is looking at you from their table at a delightful Parisian style street cafe on the surface of Mars. So I'd finally drag myself across two miles of gravel to beat a map and the game would tell me about all the extra challenges I might like to attempt. Beat the map without using hiding spots, without quick saving, in less time than it takes YouTube video essayists to get to the fucking point. And I'd say piss off game. Becoming good at these maps seems like it'd be a matter of rote memorization, And that sounds even less fun to me, not being a speedrunner or similar flavour of nutcase. Yeah, I think not finishing this one isn't gonna haunt me. Let me fondle my crystal balls and predict the ending. Revenge is had on the man who shot our pa, the family ranch is saved, and at some point everyone lines up abreast and walks very slowly towards or away from something. Now, don't get me wrong, viewer. Playing The Last of Us 2 was a pretty miserable experience. Kinda sounded like you were gonna say but there, Yahtzee. Mm, no, it's really fucking miserable and depressing, and I would have enjoyed my weekend more had I spent it teasing out my bum hairs with pliers. But it is pretty good stealth action, there's a skin of your teeth desperate sort of thrill to it, it's not difficult to lose the enemy if you do get spotted so the cock-ups don't cascade, the AI is surprisingly dynamic, they even all have individual names which they cry out in horror whenever they find a corpse, a feature that I assume exists to make the protagonists seem even more like bastards. Especially when the dudes with adorable sniffer dogs show up and after you murder them everyone yells, NO YOU KILLED DR SNIFFY BUM! AND HIS DOG! Well, that's as far as we can go without spoilers, so only continue watching if you've stopped caring, you aloof, disenfranchised zoomers, you. Here's the plot. Protagonist of last game gets murdered by group seeking revenge for thing protagonist did in last game. Adopted daughter of protagonist goes to group's home base to get double backsy revenge, which happens to be in a really shitty holiday destination. And no, it didn't escape me that this is the same plot as Silent Hill 3. Now, Joel in the last game was a basically relatable gruff hairy dad learning to love again, who made one very questionable decision at the end, but Ellie in Last of Us 2 seems to be of a mind that the best way to commemorate gruff hairy dad would be to beat his questionable decision speed record as many times as possible. Yahtzee, you don't need to sympathise with the characters for a plot to work, you like Spec Ops The Line and everyone in that game is a drawstring shitbag. Can I do a spot of disabusing here, the kind I always have to do whenever they put out a David Cage game, or anything else presenting a facade of dramatic depth? The following things do not make a character deep or compelling. 1. Getting hurt a lot, looking at you Tomb Raider reboot. 2. Being sad. 3. Doing morally questionable things. And we might as well tack on 4. Being a member of a minority, just because I've already given up hope for this video's comment section. What does matter is the characters at least be interesting to watch, and these aren't. The banter between Ellie and her girlfriend as they adventure together sizzles like a flask of slightly tepid water because they're too similar in personality, background and motivation to have good chemistry. But the most important thing is growth. Walker in Spec Ops The Lion slowly becomes a monster as he's twisted by the constant backfiring of his good intentions and that's why it's compelling. Ellie has no character development. Villain Lady does a little bit for stupid reasons, along the lines of suddenly realising that the enemy faction she's been genociding unquestioned for months are also human beings with families and would rather not be genocided, thanks. But Ellie just sets out to do something shitty and remains a shitty person. In fact, the game keeps droning on for about two hours after you think it's finally ending just to continue establishing Ellie's shittiness. And corporate game dev being what it is, when I think of the developers almost certainly being exploited and overworked to make this miserable game so unnecessarily long, I wince, viewer, I wince at the pointless suffering. Because you could strip four or five hours of gameplay out of Last of Us 2 and lose nothing, then use the money you saved to make a low-budget platformer on the side about a funny cartoon dog on a quest to sniff all the butts. Whose character grows when he realises he doesn't have to define himself by sniffing butts. Bam! Compelling plot. And we didn't even have to retroactively make him a lesbian. As with Persona 5, I'm not terribly enamoured with the combat dungeon side of things. Again, I turned the difficulty down, because when the challenge starts getting overwhelming I always get the sense that Persona expects me to compile a fucking spreadsheet and mathematically calculate a general and special theory for optimally efficient Persona crafting. And to grind! A lot more than I'm inclined to. This is also a good way to know that new, obnoxiously well-hidden side activities have become available. If you're if you're looking for the fishing minigame, give a specific soda to a child in return for a bug, give the bug to the lady shopkeeper during night time to get a fish hook, put the fish hook in a baguette sandwich and push the entire thing up your ass before five o'clock on a Wednesday and then you get a fishing rod. Oh man, I was so close, I was putting it in a quesadilla. Visual design, soundtrack, story, combat, main character's haircut, general quality of waifus, it's like a perfectly diagonal line on the graph and therefore you might as well just start with five as I did. Feels like Persona 
is the same game every time, just with all the character names changed and slightly closer to the complete vision. In theory, a Persona 6 might be even closer. Maybe it'll cut to the chase and just have a boss fight against a giant vagina, while all your female party members flusteredly refuse to admit whose it is. Now we're between big release periods, I felt it was time to give Google Stadia a go. A console without a console, where all you need is a net connection and a login and games are streamed to you with no installation required, which you'd think people would be more excited about. Having to own a console is kind of a pain in the arse when they're expensive and ugly and you could be using the shelf space for your child's yearbook or a charcuterie board. And as for high-end gaming PCs, it's like they took the monolith from 2001 and decorated it for Christmas and now I have to figure out how to arrange my office around it. But then again, it's not like there's no console at all, you're just not allowed to touch it. It's in a basement at Google somewhere and they use the heat coming off it to dry their socks. At any rate, I signed up for the Stadia Pro first month free trial for what is modern life if not one first month free trial after another, remembering to put a reminder on my calendar because 90% of the income these subscription services generate comes from people forgetting to unsubscribe before the month is up, there was a fair bit of artifacting. Almost as if all we're essentially doing is streaming web video. So this won't be your system of choice if you're the kind of person who won't give a game the time of day if it can't manage 120 FPS and more pixels than there are atoms in the universe. So while the general quality could be a problem, I fear the main one, my little velvet fuck socks, is games. I know, it's such a bore, isn't it? Having to sucker people into a subscription service and provide them content. It's like running a dairy farm would be so much easier if you didn't have to keep feeding the cows and making sure they don't die and shit. So not much else to say about guilt, it's hardly a hot app. I do wonder why the main character was looking for a younger cousin when it could easily have been a younger sister. That makes me think the story writer was working through some unresolved issues they had with their own cousin growing up, but didn't want to air the dirty laundry in too public a forum and so signed up to be a Google Stadia exclusive, thus ensuring it would never be heard from again. Usually when you say cult hit you mean reviewed well, sold like garbage. Deadly Premonition was an interesting case of selling like shit and reviewing like shit but ending up a cult hit regardless, because if you could push your way through the dense hedge of janky graphics and horrible design there was a discarded porn mag of uniqueness and character there that made it worth the brambles. The creator, Swery, is like the poor man's Hideo Kojima got together with the poor man's Suda51 and had a very undernourished baby, but he's been able to carve an identity for himself making games usually themed around an outsider's view of American culture as seen through the lens of TV, and that began with Deadly Premonition which was basically Twin Peaks Sounded like you were going to say butt there, Yards. You keep falling for that one, don't you, viewer? No, Twin Peaks about sums it up. But with Deadly Premonition 2, Swery is telling us that he's moved on from Twin Peaks and started watching True Detective instead. The game runs like a pig in high heels, on a sandy beach, in the rain. Every time you go outside you stare at a loading screen for five minutes and then the sandbox world chuggingly fades into view at 3 FPS. It's like watching a dump truck slowly inch its way into your driveway and methodically deposit shit in your face. I suppose the main takeaway of this video is that if you're one of the people who liked Deadly Premonition and are among the subset of those who are allowed to leave the house and own sharp objects, then you will find more of what you liked in Deadly Premonition 2, albeit not as much of it. And if you were able to forgive the technical flaws, atrocious game design, and Swery's trademark dramatic shifts of tone about as smooth and natural as biting down on a hitherto unnoticed caterpillar in a sandwich, then your forgiving muscles are going to have to work overtime. The game is a sandbox action adventure if the sandbox was a hundred yards wide and half a centimetre deep, with a Dead Rising-esque in-game clock defining when certain shops and missions are available, but the clock just runs too fucking slowly. I got up at nine, skateboarded across town to do a crime scene analysis, skateboarded all the way back, did four more story missions, and shot nine squirrels, the next mission didn't unlock until 6pm, I looked at the clock, it was only 9.15. There just weren't enough activities or enough hate in my heart for the squirrels of the world to fill the time. Then it got worse. Story progress is suddenly gated by some viciously arbitrary fetch quests, and one of the items needed is only sold from one of the shops on a Monday. I looked at the clock, it was Wednesday. And so FBI Special Agent Francis York Morgan went back to his hotel room and proceeded to sleep to a degree that would imply either severe depression or coma. I think Paper Mario might be my Sonic the Hedgehog. Every time they bring out another one I go, maybe this time it'll be good again and dutifully jam my dick in the beehive, and I'm beginning to think that the one time I didn't get stung on the piss hole might have been the outlier. The first three Paper Marios was like there was this one really cool teacher at Nintendo High School, then one time he showed up a little the worse for drink and after that he mysteriously vanished and his classes have been taught by one poorly informed substitute after another. Okay, apparently you were working on this thing where everyone's made of paper, I guess you were doing stationery? No, we were doing a party based RPG based around fun interesting characters. Uh, I don't have any notes about that, let's just do stationery. So once again we're basing the game around one of the fundamentals of papercraft, sticker style was glue, colour splash was paint, now Origami King is about paper folding, and I seem to remember calling this in my colour splash review. I also made a silly joke about fighting a boss fight against a hole punch. Well guess what? In Origami King, there's a boss fight against a hole punch. No really, there actually is. I think the next Paper Mario game should have a boss fight against a giant battery powered dildo, that can only be defeated with a legendary special move, send Yahtzee Crozier the password to your checking account. I'm so fucking sick of open world stealth action games with crafting and collectibles. Remember when Far Cry was a shooter, Tomb Raider was a precision platformer, and God of War was a high octane hack and slash, all of them have now been pulled into open world stealth action with crafting and collectibles, like paper boats to an open sewer. I'm so fucking bored of squatting 
in a bush like a hiker who didn't go before he left, of having to nose around every shelf and drawer, hoovering up crafting materials so I might one day make a new man purse that can hold more than four paper clips. So if you're waiting for the next electrifying sea change in AAA games, Ghost of Tsushima ain't it, mate. It's the same shit with new wallpaper. Nice wallpaper, granted. None of your default Sims house rubbish. This is the classy stuff you put behind a respected historian in a documentary about the Renaissance, but wallpaper nonetheless. Ghost of Tsushima does offer an interesting take on open world stealth action with craft- I'm sick of saying all that, I'm just gonna give it a nickname. G of Tsushi does offer an interesting take on Jiminy Cockthroat. Alright Larry, start the clock. Ghost of Tsushima is a very beautiful game, contrasting an environment full of stark cinematic colours against an atmosphere of serenity and emotional coldness to striking effect, babbling mongol hordes trying to split you up like a Terry's chocolate orange notwithstanding, and the plot, while showing a lot of the usual sandbox game bloat full of inevitable lulls in the pacing because we spent half an hour grinding iron pickups to craft a new twat hinge, is paid off at the end with a rather hauntingly good final boss fight in which all the game's themes and conflicts are paid off in a single duel between two central characters who have absolutely no desire to kill each other, but have reached a final impasse by an untenable difference in philosophy, and it's tragic and intense and moving and then of course they completely fuck it up by forcing you to meaninglessly pick one of two options from the ending Tron 3000 to get a very slight variance in the last few seconds of the game. Yes, alright Larry, I suppose I couldn't do 30 seconds of uncomplicated praise, here's your 20 quid. Why don't you try to fix this the way you fix hoarding? Take all these templates and algorithms and standard practices that make up the Jiminy Cockthroat model, go through each one, and if you can't say how it specifically improves the gameplay, chuck it in the bin. What's this one, flower collecting? Oh yes, you collect flowers to give to the merchant to craft clothing dye so you can make your armour red instead of black in the brief moment before it's completely obscured by mud and gore effects and that's going in the bin. It's going in the bin, yes. I want final massive bleeding point to mention, I really wish there was a fucking map. I get why there isn't one, we're a barely sentient pile of ground pork lost in a facility designed for humans rather than meat clouds and we lack the limb dexterity to work the buttons on a GPS, but the level design isn't exactly intuitive to navigate. Mixing up the scenery might have helped, have us devour the contents of an elementary school or blockbuster video as well as the 19 decrees industrial areas. I actually had to restart the whole game at one point because I couldn't find the way forward and I'd forgotten where I'd already been. Yes, we got by without auto maps in the olden days, but some would say we got by without the polio vaccine. It's reasonable to expect a few perks these days. In Beyond a Steel Sky, Robert Foster is now rocking a sort of Bruce Campbell does Mad Max look and must return to Union City to get to the bottom of why it keeps kidnapping children from the wasteland and why all its residents are addicted to social media all of a sudden. Ooh, is it because clumsy topical satire? Because it sounds like clumsy topical satire. The story is quite intriguing, at least early on, with Foster stealing the identity of a dead man and following a breadcrumb trail of clues to what they were getting up to while also having to pretend to be them, but it kind of drifts apart by the end, with one too many things not getting explained well enough. Why were there two Joeys? Why did the people of the city remember the end of the last game as some kind of mythic religious fable when it was like a few years ago and most returning characters haven't even visibly aged much? That'd be like someone today talking about the election of Jeremy Corbyn to Labour Party leader the way they talk about the crucifixion of Christ. The real tragedy here is that back in the days of 2D art and animation, Revolution Software were fucking killing it! Beneath a steel sky, broken sword, for their time they were like tongue kisses for the eyeballs. Then suddenly they decided they had to do 3D graphics like everyone in their greengrocer and it was like a master violinist feeling like they had to take up the ukulele. I mean, fuck me, Dave Gibbons worked on Beneath a Steel Sky, a really good 2D artist, the artist of Watchmen for fuck's sake. They brought him back on for this one and then did most of the game in 3D. That's like hiring Professor Stephen Hawking to make YouTube essays about how Ray should have porked Finn. Here's some ideas just off the top of my head. Battle Royale Euro Truck Simulator. The winner is the first to get nine tons of baby nappies to Leon. Or Battle Royale LA Noir. 100 to detectives in the living room, and all the ones that failed to notice the 1940s housewife guiltily breaking eye contact get kicked out. Well now Fall Guys is doing its bit by giving us Battle Royale Mario Party. Well, sort of. More like just all the Mario Party minigames most guaranteed to provoke screaming arguments between nine-year-olds. The premise is, you are one of 60 ambulatory sex toys being whittled down to one by a series of Takeshi's Castle Stroke Total Wipeout style elimination challenges, all dressed up in brightly coloured foam padding like we're all trapped forever in the sadistic dreams of a disgruntled bouncy castle. And every time the game randomly pulled out the fruit matching memory game, it was pure chance whether or not I'd keep playing or roll my eyes hard enough to permanently blind myself. Cause it's shit. All the chaotic fun is replaced with staring at a monitor waiting for the Simon Says prompt. It's like having to hold up the soggy biscuit game for five minutes cause the loser insisted on looking up whether or not spunk is kosher. And there's a lot of rather depressing metaphor going on in the subtext of Fall Guys. Here we are, a shapeless blob amid a field of identical shapeless blobs, struggling over each other and pushing each other down so we can be the one to be marked out as special and granted a special hat, but your new hat and esteemed status goes unnoticed as the other shapeless blobs are too busy striving for their own hats to appreciate it. Only the people running the show truly gain, and the only way to become one of those is to have been one all along. For the rest of us, this struggle only begets more struggle, until the day we finally give up and drop unmourned into the slime forever. The slime in this metaphor representing an enormous ocean of stale cum. Oh Yahtzee, have we got a surprise for you? A surprise games industry? Is it a PC release of Infamous 2? Nope. Is it Silent Hill entering the public domain? Nope. Oh, did the entire management team at EA contract cholera from giving each other rusty trombones? N I don't even know what that 
that is. No, the surprise is a game that's an awful lot like Dark Souls. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. I thought you liked Dark Souls, Yati. I did. I also had a nice time at Disneyland when I was 10, but I never wanted to fucking live there. Hello, we're like Dark Souls, is all it seems to say. Dying fantasy world, inscrutable plot, you know the drill, bish bash bosh. But Dark Souls at least give you something to go on. An intro movie that wouldn't start making sense till around the second playthrough and the instruction go ring the bells of awakening, which didn't do a whole lot of justice to the several hours of ultra-violent, directionless urban exploration between you and that goal. But it was something. Mortal Shell seems to be trying as hard as it can to out inscrutable Dark Souls. The game won't even tell you what consumable items do until you consume one. And that's the kind of learning process that got me kicked out of medical school. To the usual Dark Souls style combat of long wind-up stamina management and rolling like a cannabis dispensary just before the bank holiday weekend, we add the unique ability to press a button to very quickly think about Jenny Agatha, make yourself go rock hard, and deflect the next attack. And importantly, you can do it at any moment. So if you've mistimed your swing and the next enemy attack is going to hit you first, you can say a quick prayer to Jenny Agatha, let their attack bounce off, unfreeze when you remember Jenny Agatha's getting on a bit now, resume your swing and biff the enemy while they're still reeling from their failed attack on your invincible stiffy. Sometimes I like to picture game developers watching these videos. Ooh, look everyone, that weirdo on the internet did one of ours. Let's all gather round to good-naturedly laugh off his exaggerated criticism and bask in the occasional qualified praise. Come on, Steve, Bob, Fiona, Adolf, Lionel, Big Smelly Janet. I wonder if the developers of Battletoads are doing that now. Well, developers of Battletoads, here's the thing. I hate your game. In fact, I don't think I've ever realised I hated a game quite as fast as I realised I hated yours. I'm trying to avoid swearing here so you understand how totally sincere I am when I say I played five or six levels into Battletoads and decided I would rather spend the afternoon cleaning out the shower drains. Very few of your attacks have any satisfactory feel or impact, and that's assuming you can even get the fucking hits to land because the collision's for dog shit as well. I can be close enough to carve my initials into the enemy with my nipple piercings and still not hit them. And why are there three different buttons for grab thing with tongue? If my dude is repeatedly failing to eat a desperately needed health fly, why am I not sure if it's because the collision fucked up again or because I pressed the wrong tongue button. There's an oral sex joke in there somewhere. Battletoad's awkwardness gives it the kind of difficulty that some people might consider a badge of honour to master, but for me it'd be like mastering the art of ricocheting marbles off a tea tray so that they hit me square in the testicles. So I played something else. I played No Straight Roads on the Epic Store. It's got that same aesthetic reminiscent of rifling through vinyl album covers in a second-hand record shop you know perfectly well you're not going to buy anything from, but you've got four minutes to kill before the nuke hits. The plot presenting indie rock as the dangerous voice of youth that the man wants to keep oppressed might seem a little bit tragically quaint now that the kids these days express their feelings with memes and mass shootings, but there's humour and artistry and creative visual design and there's a sense of depth to a lot of the characters of which our brief exchanges only scratch the surface. So after all that, how does the game actually play? Shittily, as it happens. Oh well, now you know the true connection between this week's two games, besides the fact that their titles rhyme. Nice presentation, shame about the gameplay. You know, Robert Downey Jr. deserves more praise for his portrayal of Tony Stark in the Marvel movies. Yes, I know he's made more money than a glazier in the Gaza Strip, but he did a really quite impressive job playing a character who could be simultaneously abrasive, charismatic and sympathetic. I was thinking about this while watching Tony Stark as portrayed in Marvel's Avengers, Square Enix's new shiny chrome-plated hamster wheel for the micropayment masses. Because if all of his dialogue lines had been cut out and been replaced by Tony Stark getting clipped around the ear by whoever was standing closest to him, then that would have earned the game at least another star. It's still confusing to me that this game that is obviously trying to crib off the success of the Marvel movies deliberately replaced all the leads with their poorly received spin-off low-budget TV show versions, but maybe it's easier on the kiddies this way. They don't have to watch their heroes repeating an infinite cycle of copy-pasted combat missions and resource grinds and ask their parents, Mummy, why is Iron Man trapped in a hypothetical tenth layer of Dante's hell? The lovely approachable face flakes off bit by bit to reveal the cold eyeless skull underneath. You unlocked the confusingly laid out mission hub area. You unlocked the gear crafting station, the cosmetic crafting station, the faction missions, the storage lockers. Your next mission objective is to talk to all the gear vendors. We will literally hold up the plot until you fucking do that. And every single one of them has a line of dialogue specifically designed to guilt you if you leave without buying anything. Oh, you don't want any new emotes? Well, better tell the kids that it'll be sawdust porridge for dinner again. Then all those story-focused corridor missions are replaced by missions in which you go to one of a handful of pocket sandboxes, are directed to a specific location, and all the way there, copy-pasted side objectives appear all around us like we're dodging mortar shells in fucking no man's land. There's a a treasure box nearby. There's a group of bland copy-pasted enemies nearby. Why not kill them before you kill the group of bland copy-pasted enemies you actually came here to deal with? It's like being trapped in the IKEA showroom when all you want is a fucking egg whisk. But the plot takes on a deeper meaning if you look at the Avengers as an analogy for the Disney Corporation, assembling a team of franchise and media companies in order to fight against an oppressive government-backed regime bent on corporate regulation, taxation, and the dreaded Monopolies Commission. So in this metaphor, Kamala Khan as the protagonist represents an approved citizen of the corporatocracy who buys all the merch and dutifully wet 
wet Sir Stanley autographed knickers over the right brands. And then each Avenger represents one of Disney's acquisitions. Thor represents Pixar, old school fantasy hero popular with the kids. The Hulk represents Fox, a veneer of respectability over an instrument of total societal destruction. And Iron Man represents Star Wars, used to be good when better actors were involved, now deserves to choke to death on its own cum. It's always nice when a random game really grabs me. It's like hitting it off with an attractive stranger in a bar who doesn't keep an eye on their drink and doesn't question my unmarked van. And I thought it might be educational to list some things it didn't do to grab me, games industry. It didn't put out a pre-rendered trailer six years before release showcasing all its crazy characters with magenta coloured partial buzz cuts. It didn't use an aggressive levelling system to increase engagement the way a drug dealer increases engagement by cutting the blow with laundry detergent. And it doesn't have Batman in it. No, what it did was, it made me emotionally engage with it. I play a game like Gears of War, I'm in constant life or death struggle with snarling monsters that want to exterminate humanity, and I'm more emotionally engaged with the cheese and pickle sandwich I'm taking sneaky bites of between reloads. It kills off a main character, I feel more remorse when my wife notices pickle stains on the dog. In contrast, I played Spiritfarer, got to the part where an old hedgehog with dementia remembers who I am in the brief moment before she disappears, and I cried. I actually did, fuck you. There's also some Stardew Valley in here, since you have to grow crops, cook meals, and feed your passengers the things they like to keep the ungrateful dying bastards happy. The primary gameplay loop is a workaday routine that your passengers are woven into just enough to get you used to seeing them around. And that's why it's an emotional lurch when it's time to take them behind the woodshed. Because when you get back from seeing off Dennis the Slug, for a while you're not harvesting lettuce anymore, you're harvesting the lettuce Dennis the Slug used to like. You can't do the stud farm minigame without thinking about how Dennis the Slug taught you the optimal method for bringing off a horse. And of course, that lovely house you built for Dennis the Slug stands empty on your boat for the rest of the game, and by the end your ship is struggling to stay afloat under the weight of countless two-storey tombstones, just as our souls are burdened with the memories of times past, both good and bad, until the day we let it go. Metaphors! Oops, I think I heard the bell. That means it's time to qualify that praise. Also, while the story is brought across by the atmosphere and visuals is very effective, it falls short in the dialogue. It's a bit overwritten. Yes, the final monologue before a character gets iced is usually a bit of a knee in the feely parts, but at other times there are too many characters whose quirk is that they talk too much. Accidentally press talk instead of buy while interacting with the merchant, and you're locked into the mash message skip mambo for 30 seconds. Finally, Spirit Spiritfarer fails to stick the landing. Once you've iced enough motherfuckers, you get a sequence that reveals a significant truth about Stella, and it's the high point where the game should have ended. Sadly, the nature of the beast means it instead goes, right, when you're done finishing off your last few grindy side quests, come back here to end the game properly. And then Stella's journey inevitably dribbles limply to a conclusion at the point when you get bored and decide to pack it in. All the emotion in the process of resolving your last passenger is lost as you're thinking, yeah, just hurry up and have a fucking epiphany, asshole. Some of us have places to be. Nevertheless, I recommend Spiritfarer. In this numb, unsympathetic world, anything that makes me feel something is worth celebrating. That's why I don't take the price tags off my underpants. Regular viewers will know that unnecessary colons in titles make me want to evacuate my own colon onto the games in question, and a related issue that equally deglazes my skillet with piss is what I like to call the non-abbreviated abbreviation, as seen in DMC Devil May Cry or FTL Faster Than Light. Ooh, let's use a cool three-letter abbreviation as our title, says Johnny Game Developer. That way it will be remembered just as fondly as the film LXG League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Good idea, says Susie Game Developer, no relation. And on that note, just in case people don't realise what it's supposed to stand for, we should put the full sentence somewhere nice and subtle and barely noticeable like on the end of the same fucking title. Yes, that way we will enjoy the dual benefit of abbreviating, i.e. shortening the name, while simultaneously making it slightly longer. We are both screaming twats. But with the game being 90% primary loop, there's not much room for anything else. There's only eight levels to a run and no plot to speak of unless you count the story of several bullets and their amazing journey across a room into the body of a giant spider. So good core combat and that's about it. Not much else to say, so might as well move on to the second game I played this week. There was no second game this week, Yahtzee. If you'll recall, you spent the whole week playing BPM because you enjoyed the core combat so much. Did I? Yes, you were planning to find something to double bill it with, but then you got lazy and decided to keep playing BPM until you found some things that annoyed you about about it. I am behind a shield and cannot be attacked head on, crow several late game enemies. What are you gonna do about that, dipshit? Ha! <laughs> you missed. Oh, I'm dead, as are all my friends. I think there are a lot of items that need a rebalancing. There just isn't enough con to balance the grenade launcher's pros. It needs a smaller clip or a more complex reload, or a little bar that pops out and hits you in the balls between each shot. It is very short range, Yahtzee. I'll oh, piss off. Who keeps the monsters at long range? I'm trying to kill these motherfuckers, not take artful photographs of them. And while we're on the subject, the minigun sucks my big fat drinking straw. It's a minigun that can't fire rapidly. That's like owning a Dixie's Midnight Runners album that doesn't have Come On Eileen on it. At the end of the day, BPM Bullets Prime Minister is a perfect illustration of why the primary gameplay loop is so important. Because despite lacking much substance, the sheer catharsis of the combat made me want to play it way longer than I wanted to keep playing, say, Last of Us 2. Perhaps as many as 12 seconds. In these uncertain times, is it me or is the phrase in these uncertain times starting to supplant the word hello? It's important to focus on the stabilities of life. The earth will continue to turn, the sun will continue to rise, if partially concealed by a haze of orange smoke 
cloak like the face of a loved one appearing briefly at the surface of an unsanitary piranha tank, and the new Serious Sam game is going to play pretty much like all the other ones. God bless you, Crow Team, for being as reliably unmoving as a donkey on a staircase. All of these cliché demi-plots are handled fairly ineptly and the tone is all over the place. Logo t-shirt wearing kooky loudmouth Serious Sam Stone finds himself having to be haunted and sad over the death of an ally, and it's like watching Barney the Dinosaur trying to play Macbeth. Then two seconds later they're doing that running gag where they're constantly struggling to come up with good one-liners after killing something. A running gag that runs a little too long for my taste, it's running in the sense of goodness there's a lot of pus running out of these open sores. The story of Serious Sam 4 is a janky construct of awkwardly animated stock characters and badly established subplots, and the main point I take away from it is that Crow Team are a bunch of complete dorks, and Serious Sam the character is entirely what one should expect from a badass action hero as envisioned by a bunch of complete dorks. Muscle-bound, violent, and about as socially adept as a sperm whale at a birthday party. Actually, skill points are kind of rare. They're tied to special items you have to find that I only found like five or six in the whole game. You'd probably find more if you do more secret hunting, but I know what you're like with secrets, Crow Team. Having us go to random building number 871, jump off a bollard onto a lamppost, onto an air conditioner, onto a sparrow's erection, and then do the obscure physics exploit jump that shimmies you along a wall and transports you to Narnia. And after all that, the skills you can unlock are mostly pointless extra mechanics, like the ability to dual wield pistols and fire the game's shittiest gun at a slightly faster rate, in case you're hoping to make the enemies feel bad about attacking someone obviously mentally disabled. Hades is a new game, fresh off the fiery grill of early access, and as the title suggests, is themed around Greek mythology, boo, but it's by Supergiant Games, yay! So I guess I can forgive it. Supergiant Games have a very distinct style. You know you're playing a Supergiant game if it's got colourful hand-painted graphics, isometric gameplay, very strong writing focus on world building and characters, and all the voice acting sounds like it's coming from very sexy people. Hades is about Zagreus, the son of the titular deity who has gotten sick of kicking around the depths of Tartarus playing Halo, and very deliberately pretending not to notice the pamphlets for vocational schools his dad rather unsubtly keeps leaving on the coffee table, and so he decides to pull what's known as the Reverse Orpheus and journey out of the underworld for the first time in his life. And there's nothing you can do to stop me, Dad! Um, I literally rule over legions of immortal warriors with nothing to do all day but try to stop you, Zagreus. Shut up! You never bought me a car! It must feel weird when somebody else makes a sequel to your franchise, like when the babysitter insists on being called Mummy. It must be doubly weird when you thought your franchise died years ago and the babysitter has just shown up at your door at the dead of night with a shovel and a weird smile. I think it's fair to say that Crash Bandicoot didn't exactly leave loose ends untied, it wasn't the fucking wheel of time, it was pretty thoroughly explored out as a concept. You don't bring out a fucking kart racing tie-in game when you can't see the bottom of the idea bucket. And yet here comes Toys for Bob, 20 years down the line, clutching its big shiny shovel, going, don't worry Naughty Dog, we will continue the great work in the original spirit you intended. And meanwhile Naughty Dog moved on years ago and are now more concerned with making terribly serious and important games about very unpleasant people fucking each other on smallpox blankets. Toys for Bob did the Switch port for the Crash Bandicoot and Sane Trilogy remasters, and maybe they felt they could make something new with the assets they already had lying around. It's like when you make the Lego Star Destroyer according to the instructions, but then get bored and make your own custom spaceship out of some of the parts and the corpse of the family cat. Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time's plot, concerns all of Crash Bandicoot's old villains doing their usual thing, i.e. trying to take over the universe, and Crash Bandicoot has to stop them by doing his usual thing, i.e. failing to land on a narrow perch and falling to his death like a drunk sparrow with no legs 900 million times. On the whole it plays very much like Crash Bandicoot's 1 to 3, with their signature linear semi-3D platforming, so congratulations Toys for Bob, despite coming decades after the fact you have successfully evoked the spirit of the PS1 platformer by creating what feels like a cheap sequel hacked out inside a year. The gameplay is full of little mounting frustrations, and the main thing driving you to complete it will probably be spite. You'll want to finish so you can finally lean back, breathe free, carefully remove the hard drive and punt it through a closed window. It's been so long since the last Amnesia game I almost forgot it existed, ironically. LOL! And even longer since the last instalment by Frictional Games, A Machine for Pigs was of course developed by the Chinese Room, and had all the gameplay of a supermarket conveyor belt covered in pork products, not to mention a rather off-putting subtitle, but I remember saying at the time at least it didn't go for some incredibly generic one-word sequel name, inevitably beginning with the letters RE, in which case, oh dear oh dear oh dear Amnesia Rebirth. You left the starting blocks and one of your shoes has already fallen off. You explore spooky environments while using your limited supply of oil and matches to minimise the amount of time you spend in pitch darkness, where you run the risk of suffering a major trouser accident and lethally bankrupting yourself with dry cleaning expenses, and you have to balance all that while solving inventory puzzles and hiding from gribblies, which it turns out you're only in actual danger from about 5% of the time, but you don't know which 5%, ooh. And of course there's still that trademark Frictional Games physics interaction, where you open doors by clicking the mouse and then moving the mouse and realising you should have moved it the other way, dumb twat. The general problem is one of demystification, I think. In The Dark Descent we only learn scripts and scraps about an evil Lovecraftian other dimension that's causing all the problems, but in Amnesia Recalcitrant, Tazzy gets to physically go to one. In fact she pops in and out of it every ten minutes, like she's never quite convinced that she locked the doors properly the last time she was there. At one point she takes the public subway train in the evil Lovecraftian dimension and misses her stop because the map was confusing. No really, this happens. It's one of the things that draws out the runtime, like your mum's waistband at the cock buffet. Amnesia The Dark Descent was such an influential game of its time, I guess I was expecting more. Dark Descent brought us to an interesting place and other games have since explored that interesting place further, but Amnesia itself 
seems to just want to stay in the car listening to Radio 4. Hey everybody, it's October, the time of writing. The month when all the ooky spooky games pop up like Rigor Mortis Erections at an open casket funeral. And hey, it's also 2020, the year of shit, where everything is shit and human civilization circles the toilet bowl like the latter two thirds of last night's sweet corn burrito. So what better way to mark the occasion than with a really shit horror game? Step forward, the remothered franchise. I must admit, I didn't go out of my way to try the first one, because it was one horror game among hundreds, and who the fuck knows anymore what IPs have got staying power and which are just going to burst on the surface of steam like passing zits. I'm like a bloke who runs a Eurasian uranium mine who doesn't bother committing the names of any workers to memory until they've survived at least three shifts. So when a sequel to Remothered came out, I thought, ooh, guess it was worth at least four fifths of a damn, let's check it out! Well it's a good thing Remothered Broken Porcelain doesn't work in a uranium mine because it'd cause severe morale issues with the horrible things it leaves in the communal latrine. It's a bad one, friends. So bad I want to bend it over my autopsy table and really work out what the fuck happened. If I were to describe the visuals of Remothered Talking Bicycle in ten words or less, I'd go for murky murky murky, murky 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 murky, murky contextual button prompt. Actually, Actually, the most reliable strategy is to wait for their AI to fuck up. One time I saw the chasing monster just standing there in the middle of the murky corridor, they ignored all my distraction objects, so I just awkwardly tried to squeeze past them, thinking, this is either a bug or there's a very cunning jump scare coming up. Spoiler alert, it was the first one. As if remothered trombone pederast could ever successfully be scary. I probably gave remothered solipsist hairdryer more time than it deserved. I made it all the way through about nine confusing plot developments to a puzzle where I was supposed to open a voice activated safe. Now I could hear one of the villains talking to his sock puppets in a nearby room, and I had a tape recorder. I felt like I was ready to put all the pieces of this mind melter together, so I stood where the dialogue was loudest and pressed the use button, and my big titted Jodie Foster look-alike protagonist got out her sound recorder and sort of waved it a bit like she was using it to check for ghosts. So did that do it? I went back to the safe and I pressed use on it and the lady said BINGO and then nothing happened. I gave up at that point, I'm not gonna stand here being made to feel silly because you gave me a square peg and a square hole and then stretched cling film around the latter, remothered audacious wallpaper. I took enough of that bullshit from 90 adventure games. I'll say one thing for the age in which we live, at least we might finally get that evil cyberpunk future we've always dreamed about. Yes, it'll mean an age of corporate oppression and rampant income inequality, but on the bright side, rollerblading might come back. Probably why everyone's looking forward to Cyberpunk 20 whatever it was, they're keen to get some practice in before Amazon starts reserving breathable air for Prime subscribers. Well, to tide you over while you're waiting, here's another cyberpunk game called Ghost Runner. Rather a generic name. If the word runner has been tacked on and there doesn't seem to be much athletics going on, you know you're dealing with cyberpunk. See also Blade Runner, Net Runner, Shadow Runner, Tech Runner. That last one I made up, but you thought it was real, didn't you? That's my point. And the good thing about Ghost Runner's plot is that it's so fucking mind-numbingly predictable it's virtually impossible to spoil. If I were to tell you that Mr. G Runner Esquire has two voices in his earpiece, one a stern taskmaster who keeps downplaying our humanity and advising us not to stop to save civilians because piles of bodies are useful for reaching high shelves, the other a tearful bunny rabbit who dreams with glimmering eyes of a better world for all, who asks you to please save all their whittle forest friends because it'd be such a shame to waste all the lovely cakes she baked for tea. Which of those two characters would you think turns on us before the end. And without wishing to give any more away, I had a mystical premonition halfway through that the ending of the game was going to rip off the ending of Robocop, and funnily enough that's exactly what it did. But forget about the plot, the writers did the instant the first draft was turned in. The platforming sections are more hit and miss because there's usually only one route, and then there are the boss fights which are 100% miss, absolute no hit zone there. The first one has you escaping from a gigantic game of Kaplunk where lasers fire in all directions like stiffies at a nudist debutante ball, and your only choice is to add Mr. Trial and Mr. Error to your dance card, but it's still better than the second boss fight with angry girl ninja where the only way to win is to parry all her strikes and the point when you press parry appears to be completely unrelated to the way her limbs randomly flail in all directions, like she's the fluffer at the nudist debutante ball and there's only five seconds to go before the big midnight jizz fountain, but even that is still better than the final boss fight with Dr. Octopus. You'd think the main advantage of Dr. Octopus tentacles would be increased mobility, so it's a little baffling why Dr. Octopus just fucking sits there like a pile of dodgy sauerkraut, challenging you to a rather humiliating game of Simon Says. So yeah, it's like working at a failing retailer, things are alright on the ground level but the bosses are all fucking terrible. Well you know what, for all Ghost Runner's flaws it definitely shows improvement, so nice job lads. You went from giving us a dog poo sandwich to giving us a normal sandwich with dog poo on the side, some of which still got on the sandwich but that was probably more the fault of whoever was packing the takeout box. What am I on about? Alright I have to be professional about something, don't worry this won't last long. I need to disclose that I worked on Watch Dogs Legion, not in a hugely significant capacity, they just hired me to punch up the dialogue for the AI support character who keeps making inappropriate jokes, and they didn't use all my lines, I think they felt some of my inappropriate jokes weren't appropriate. Point is, it was just a bit of punching up and shouldn't preclude me from giving an unbiased review of the game, okay? Okay. So you have uncovered my sinister plan, insert name here. No matter, I have a general sense that you can't stop me. It's painfully obvious that all your current character's dialogue lines were recorded out of context, so the mixing and tone of voice usually feels weirdly off kilter with the rest of the scene. And what certainly doesn't help is that there seems to be no setting for accents in this game besides cartoonishly broad. It's like listening to a Mary Poppins era Dick Van Dyke doing a one-man table read for an episode of Captain
Captain Planet. As I said, the lack of strong characterization does hurt the story. I mean, I'm pretty sure most real people would respond to complete strangers asking them to join their best friend's no oppressive regimes allowed treehouse club with either bafflement or a face full of commercial grade pepper spray. But it does mean it's easier to amuse yourself by making up your own stories for your characters. The game forces you to recruit a construction worker as part of the tutorial, and I ended up using that dude to complete the final mission because fuck. From token member hired only because we wanted to play on his rideable drone to champion of the resistance, this dude's had a motherfucking arc. Also, for the sake of extra challenge, I decided that he refuses to use any form of transport other than riding on top of double decker buses because of a childhood trauma involving a model train set and a crab. Also, he strictly avoids violence while on missions because the sight of blood reminds him of Cheltenham FC, and when combat is required, he defers to his teammate, Crazy Mildred the Elderly Nailgun Murderer, who has to knock down every lamppost she sees to raise awareness of child leukemia, and who wears a really stupid hat. So you remember that Dark Pictures Man of Medan thing that Supermassive Games burped out, and how they were threatening to make it a full-on horror anthology series? Well apparently their demands weren't met, so they've been forced to inflict another one upon us. Supermassive Games should not be confused with Supergiant Games. I know they mean the same thing, but Supergiant Games makes interesting games that push the boundaries of the interactive storytelling medium, and Supermassive Games makes interactive movies. A phrase which for me remains almost as foreboding as, hey is your nuclear reactor supposed to be doing that? Anyway, the new Dark Pictures episode is called Little Hope, which funnily enough is also what Supermassive Games have for getting the promised eight game series out of this tosh before interest dries up. The story begins with the vehicle on its way to a small American town crashing after it swerves to miss a mysterious dark haired girl who appears in the middle of the road, whereupon the survivors of the crash go looking for someone who's missing and end up in a weird foggy version of the town full of twisted monsters representing- wait a minute, this is just Silent Hill. Well at Silent Hill if instead of exploration and combat and masterfully crafted atmosphere you just got tied to a length of rope and dragged through a linear sequence of events, and if instead of Silent Hill it was called five abrasive dipshits who never shut the fuck up. Hill. After the crash we then go through a second prologue sequence set in the 70s in which a family with hilarious retro haircuts all die in a house fire. Well, undeniably hilarious as those retro haircuts were, game, why did you show me that? Oh no reason, right back to the bus crash and scary town. Well I suppose now we know that just like Man of Medan there's gonna be some reveal at the end of all this that ties everything together, and just like Man of Medan it will probably make the whole game feel like a complete waste of fucking time. And the other reason it's hard to judge their characterization is because 90% of the dialogue is some variation on the phrase, we have to find a way out of here. Blunder through fog, find a building, get inside, Let's find a way out of here. Then why did you come in here, dipshits? At least sign the fucking guest book. <laughs> Can I offer a suggestion, Supermassive? How about, for the third Dark Pictures episode, you make the plot twist something other than it was all a hallucination? Maybe don't kill any desire I have to replay it after it turns out 90% of the characters we're trying to keep alive aren't fucking real! That Crypt Keeper narrated dude was being all like, ah, but remember that the truth might not always be as it seems, and I was like, oh fuck, it's hallucinations again, isn't it? Maybe I've misunderstood, maybe every episode will be hallucinations and the mystery is figuring out what's causing them each time. In Man of Medan it was gas, in Little Hope it's survivor's guilt, and next time it'll be, I don't know, someone drew penises all over the main character's contact lenses. Fair play to Assassin's Creed, it held out longer than a lot of series would. I mean it did the fucking American War for Independence before it did Vikings. That's like forcing yourself to eat all the party napkins before you can have any of the birthday cake. But there's no putting off going full Viking forever as one of the points on the graph. Ninjas, pirates, Vikings. And I guess maybe cowboys. Hey, is that a Ubisoft drone? Oh shit, it's taking notes. Sorry everyone, don't know how they keep getting in here. If they announce Assassin's Creed Deadwood next year, I guess you can all blame me. And I can't help feeling there's a bit of wanting to have one's roast boar and eat it going on here, as we and our group of hairy tattooed raiders run up to an English monastery to smash all the windows and set fire to everyone's pubes, and then a monk gets caught in the melee between me and the poorly equipped Sanxon bodyguard who was just trying to do his job, and the game goes whoops, don't kill civilians or you'll desynchronize. the implication being that killing innocent monks is in some way out of character for someone who is, at that precise moment, pillaging a monastery. There's still the bird scouting and the RPG elements from the last two games, but it's a little closer in spirit to the Assassin's Creed 2 era since you've got a home village to pour resources into and a bit more of a story focus, but who the fuck cares? It's just another point on the line graph, another shake of the bag full of the same shit. The only thing that really marks it out is that instead of the climbing all over elaborately realised cathedrals and palaces we got in previous games, you're leaping across mud huts and wattling and 15 copy pasted examples of the same viking longhouse. Because it's the fucking dark ages, and they missed a the trick by still having us jump into piles of straw and leaves, when it would have been much more authentic to replace them with gigantic piles of shit. I guess Ubisoft thought that might have been a little uncomfortably representative of the company's trajectory over the years. So that's Assassin's Creed Valhalla, noteworthy only for its extreme unnoteworthiness. What a dull way to end the video. Here's a picture of a leopard in a scarf. Huh, that's odd. Records seem to indicate that a new console generation began at some point in the last few weeks, and yet mysteriously, I don't seem to care. I just double checked, and yes, I'm still mostly just feeling the usual blend of boredom and alcohol saturated dread. Sorry Sony and Microsoft, this doesn't usually happen to me. Maybe I'd get in the mood if the two of you make out while I watch, but you know, it does kind of feel like absolutely fuck all has changed. But hey, there hasn't been a single console in all of gaming history that wouldn't have benefited from holding out its release for six months or so. Maybe I'll feel differently once I actually have access to a PS5, 
drive and the console doesn't exist merely as a glint in an eBay scalper's eye. And obviously you're going to be playing as Spider-Man again, hopefully we learned our lesson last time that not playing as Spider-Man in the Spider-Man game is like throwing away the condom and sticking the wrapper on your cock. But wait Yati Crozor, you snake in the sock drawer, you don't play as the original Spider-Man in this game, you play as Miles Morales. Did you accidentally cover up the title with spit when all the racial diversity sent you into fits of conservative rage? Look at it this way, obviously baiting viewer. Spider-Man is about a nerdy teenager who likes science and is a good boy who gets spider powers and a dead father figure and has to balance vigilante heroics with their troublesome personal life. Absolutely, bugger all has changed. Well obviously the swinging is back as well as the combat and stealth, but where the last game had a tendency to reward you for getting through stealth sections undetected by spawning a bunch more enemies you're forced to fight head on, the way a retail manager rewards their most diligent employee by giving them the closing shift every fucking night, Miles Morales tends not to do that so much, and even when it does Miles has a new cloaking power that allows him to turn the combat situations back into stealth challenges, which like a butcher's end of day clearance sale does rather lower the stakes. When you can smash the cloak button at any point, piss off, and wait for the usual collective brain aneurysm that makes all the baddies split up to go look for you. You hardly even fucking need stealth at that point, smash a dude into a drum kit with a howler monkey in front of seven of his mates. Who cares, we can fucking cloak! Our subject is Ichiban Kasuga, a Yakuza enforcer who was recruited on opposite day and spends most of their time handing out free money to people, and beating the snot out of other professional criminals for committing crimes. But fate turns on Ichiban when he has to take the rap for a shooting to preserve his mentor stroke father figure's honour and returns to Kamurocho after a long prison sentence to get to the bottom of his betrayal. Now wait just a minute, Yati moustache contaminating Croshaw, wasn't Kazuma Kiryu in the first game also an opposite day Yakuza, who also took the rap for a shooting to preserve someone's honour, and also returned after a long prison sentence to etc? Yes, and believe me, I had no small amount of concern for Yakuza like a Rolling Stone before I started, the story seemed to be treading enough old ground to irritate all the world's archaeologists, and then there was the reveal that it was going to have turn-based combat. And if there's any franchise where the combat has never needed any drastic fixes, it's Yakuza, the games that routinely cut from grown men making understated threats to each other with very serious faces, to those same grown men twatting the absolute three bean salad out of each other with benches, traffic cones and passing old ladies. And while Itchy Bum is an ass kicking Yakuza who wears disco suits, he's got a character of his own distinct from Kazuma Kiryu, mainly because he doesn't emote like a print of American Gothic glued to a cast iron fridge. At one point Ichiban becomes the president of a corporation because someone looks at your unemployed homeless ex-Yakuza protagonist and says this person seems trustworthy and good with money, and must manage the funding and staff placement of several businesses day to day. I found it weirdly absorbing, it's dynamic, it's goal oriented, it's got a little 8-bit sprite of Ichiban running along symbolically collecting money. I did fail the shareholders meeting minigame at first because the mechanics are very poorly explained, but I'm mainly bringing that up just because I love the phrase shareholders meeting minigame. Truly good and original games are like the itchy spots you get from a venereal disease, a product of love that's satisfying to scratch, yes, but soon there'll be a lot more of the buggers, and none of them will be as interesting as the first. Case in point, Breath of the Wild. Ooh, we like this game, we said to the soulless Daleks that run the games industry. We think it's atmospheric and mechanically intricate and offers a bold new take on the interactive narrative experience. Also it made a lot of money. Replicate! Replicate! Regurgitate! Ugh. Immortals Phoenix Rising. What's the strategy here, guys? Hey, if we give our game the worst title in the history of anything, maybe the rest of the game will look good by comparison. Good thinking! Now are there any I's in the name we can replace with Y's? Boy, I wish I could list all the original ideas that went into Immortals bile churning, but I fear I might never start. The last desperate Hail Mary attempt to establish at least some kind of fucking identity for itself is the open quotes funny dialogue, wherein all the characters communicate entirely in sassy quips. There's a narrative device where Prometheus is recounting the story of the game to Zeus, so every now and again they'll comment on your actions like Statler and fucking Waldorf, and it's like they're auditioning for How I Met Your Mother Classical Antiquity Edition. So we forget about all that, run back down the mountain and get into some combat instead, which is pretty generic and not terribly hard when you have the basics down. The parry window is roughly the length of an episode of The Great British Bake Off. The only X factor is making sure you craft enough attack power upgrades with your various multicoloured crystal meth supplies to keep up when the baddies' health bars start getting long enough that they have to book two seats when they go on commercial flights. Ubisoft between this and monastery pillaging in Assassin's do you have anyone left there who knows anything about human emotion? Sure we do. Um... It was a song by Smokey Robinson, wasn't it? Hey kids, what starts with Sir, ends in punk, and has been splashed onto the computer screens of lonely single gamers the world over. That's right, cyberpunk, the hot new immersive sim conveniently if unimaginatively named after its genre. The genre of choice for people who hate capitalism but love looking like a member of Dead or Alive after they stepped on a landmine. I say immersive sim, I feel that description hinges on the game being in some way immersive. I was playing the Steam version, which might more accurately be termed a buggier than a party sub that got left on the floor of a motel bathroom. Sim. Let's focus on the stuff the game meant to do, like the love 
lovely titties, and the working its developers half to death. Cyberpunk is set in the high-tech dystopian sprawl of Night City, and it's still called that during the day, which strikes me as a bit of an oversight, and the main character is V, of Vendetta fame, a jobbing mercenary on a quest for the big time. After a heist on a corpo stronghold goes cyber tits up, V finds themselves with six months to live and a piece of classified tech jammed in their bonds which makes them hallucinate the ghost of Keanu Reeves, who in this world was a legendary freedom fighter who died in a blaze of glory, sticking it to the man, and was also a hard-drinking rock guitarist that everyone wanted to fuck and probably had a really big knob. Bit laughable, really. It's like what used to happen whenever Gene Simmons got cast in a film and was given any amount of creative control. By the end of my game I had high stats in everything except tech, so my V was a super strong gun-toting tank who was also a stealthy ninja, and a master hacker who could insta-kill a good amount of the enemies just by looking at them funny and thinking about it, but who was absolutely useless at mending DVD players. Even the non-facetious tech skills didn't seem terribly useful, like crafting. I didn't craft Jack fucking Thompson in this game, and still ended up with 50 spare health kits and more bullets than John Lennon's corpse. For every well-designed open-ended mission with multiple approaches there's one that just forces you into combat, or ends anticlimactically because the target clipped through a bus shelter. So I'd say this is the AAA horse plop plop syndrome again, the result of too many people working on the game who were trying to look busy. Sure there's a theoretically nice plate of steak fries here, but it's partially buried in potato peelings, and I don't understand why you peeled so many more potatoes than you actually needed, nor why you literally enslaved a few people to get them all peeled in time. Also not to make a fuss, but I ordered a salad! It's the end of 2020 and I think I speak for everyone and their clenched sphincters when I say thank fuck that's over with. Let's hope in 2021 we can start rolling things back to the previous more stable state of hell on earth. We might have been living in constant fear of climate disaster and financial ruin under leaders that could barely display the minimum pretense of caring, but at least we could still hug our elderly relatives as they died gurgling on their flooded lungs. This year I coined the term Jiminy Cockthroat to refer to the gameplay style that every AAA game has now. Stealth action open world with crafting and collectibles and probably that one mission where they take your stuff away and leave it on a table six feet from your cell in an astonishingly small bag. But it's a style that's overdone for a reason, so let's give one of them a prize. Ghost of Tsushima. I can't pronounce your name without spitting on the mic, but your art design's good so you're officially the least shit. Have a stale biscuit. As any of the agencies currently tracking my movements will tell you, I do like weird things. I'd play a Christmas themed felching simulator that only makes sense to the homeless meth addict with a shoe on his head who designed it, but it has to not run like gravel through a chocolate fountain, hence Deadly Premonition 2 being fifth worst. You're an odd little duck and I like you, Swery, but your amusing quacks can't keep you out of the hoisin sauce forever. I was going over some of my previous top 5 videos and thought, man, do I make a joke every single year about the inevitability of a Ubisoft sandbox being in the bland 5? You have to point these things out to me, guys. Most New Years I'm too drunk to remember. What? Oh, any of them, it hardly matters. Immortals Phoenix Rising, there you go. Really shitty title and the exploration is about as exciting as combing nits out of your pubes. God, is there anything worse than a bad game that thinks it's funny? Pustular psoriasis? Oh, maybe. The remaining two games on your list? Alright, rhetorical! It's Battletoads. Why stop at boring, poorly designed gameplay when you could also add hilarious prolonged comedy animations to make it slow, clunky and confusing as well? It's like trying to count ceiling tiles while a clown is sitting on your face. True greatness has often been found in the pursuit of the pointless. Climbing Mount Everest is ultimately pointless and yet every year people kill themselves trying to do it. You too can get in touch with that spirit by playing The Dark Picture's Little Hope, because once you get through its disjointed quick time event riddled story and discover that the whole endeavour was completely pointless, you too will want to kill yourself. Yeah, it's a bit buggy and has a weak ending, but Spiritfarer is still the game I think most fondly of from this year. The lovely heartwarming cartoon adventure about how everyone you love is going to die. Appropriate for 2020, really. Your elderly relative might have died gurgling on their flooded lungs, but hey, life is a journey and death is coming home. Why not imagine them as a giant anthropomorphic toad and feed them fried chicken on a boat? Okay. There was a time when Marvel Comics getting a massive multi-film big budget crossover universe would have been exciting, but now it's here and it's blown its load a few times over with generic supervillains and badly explained MacGuffins, it's hard to maintain enthusiasm. And the fact that Crystal Dynamics managed to take that and somehow make an even duller and more jaded version clearly deserves the top spot in the blandness list, and perhaps even a lifetime achievement award for blandness, if they can be bothered to pick it up. I'm not trying to be contrarian, I genuinely can't think of a game that gave me a more miserable experience than The Last of Us 2. And here we fucking go. Ooh, look at Mr. Controversial opinions. You think the Game Awards Game of the Year was actually the worst game ever, do ya? And you think all the people who think it's good are wrong, do ya? And you think the Game Awards have their noses shoved so far up AAA buttholes that they wouldn't notice a good game if it was speedbagging their testicles, do ya? And you're going to put all these views into the mouth of a notional third party in a weak attempt at creating deniability, are ya? You're gonna interrupt at some point? I wasn't, no.